If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. Campers and hikers, what are your creepiest rural and backcountry stories? The things you can't explain? The most freaked out you've been in the deep woods, on trails, or in forests? My wife's family lives on a reserve in the Algonquin area of Canada, and the encounters with skinwalkers in that area are endless. I've heard stories of 20 or more people seeing this thing at once, but no one likes to talk about it. My wife as well as my mother-in-law have seen what they believed was a skinwalker in the same place about 30 years apart, a huge black thing with red eyes in their grandmother's basement. That grandma now lives in a different house, and we often stay with her. Last Thursday, we had to stay the night. I hate it there, even though I'm not usually afraid of stuff like that. Her place gives me absolute creeps. We're in bed, and it's about 2 a.m., and I have to go to the bathroom, so I walk across the upstairs and pass her grandma's room, and I can see right into her room and the clock leads, etc. On my way back, I had this overwhelming urge to run as fast as possible back to our room, so I did. I noticed passing her room that I could no longer see in, there was this absolutely massive being standing in the doorway. I was petrified. When I came back, my wife asked what was out there because she could feel it too. I couldn't see their eyes, but it wasn't human, and I've never experienced anything like that before. Could it be attached to her grandma? This woman is in poor health and has dementia, so I wouldn't be surprised. I also don't scare easily, I tend to go and find out what's going on rather than literally running away. It wanted to intimidate me. Any theories? Suggestions? Burn the house down? So we weren't exactly in the backcountry. My family and I were camping at a campground on a lake here in the Ozarks a couple years ago. My sister, her friend, my cousin, and I are all in a tent together. I'm trying to get some sleep, but it's very humid and difficult to get comfortable. Around 3 a.m., I am looking straight up and notice a long flash of light outside of the tent. I look, and it blinks again about three seconds later, but not in the same place. It's very close to the tent, less than three feet away. I couldn't see it perfectly, obviously, but I could just tell. It's not like an on-slash-off blink, it fades in and out. It's dead quiet, and no animal or creature could make a light as white and as bright as this. I couldn't hear anything walking around the tent. It blinks again. Eventually, this blinking light makes its way in a circle around the tent, near the entrance where I was. That's when I promptly rolled the duck over and closed my eyes because, whatever it was, I didn't want to see it. About 30 minutes later, I sat up to grab some water. I sit there for a minute, wondering. There it is again, on the opposite side of the tent from me. Making its way around. I man the duck up, grab a light, and unzip the tent as it nears the entrance. It stops and goes dark. I go outside, and nothing is there. I made a fire and stayed up all night smoking cigarettes. I freaked the hell out. So, it was a group of guys. We went way back into the woods and walked for nearly an hour in deep Appalachian terrain. There is lots of slick red clay. There are lots of mosquitoes. We got to the spot and started setting up. Right next to a bend in the creek. We cooked, ate, and made stupid jokes, then we made a big fire and waited for night. Finally, night came. The conversation was calming, but no one was ready to bed down. Then I heard it. Off in the dark, the sound of two small girls giggling. I thought I had absolutely lost my mind. It kept repeating at uneven intervals. Even more worrisome, it kept bouncing from place to place in the woods. I resolved to say nothing and live in my insanity for the night. I leaned up against a tree and held my machete close, not that it would help. I was starting to spiral when my friend said, okay, is no one else hearing that? I immediately ask him what he's hearing. He says, it sounds like two little girls laughing in the woods. I've never been more freaked out and happy at the same time. All of us, but one that was trying to be the cool guy went into a frenzy talking about hearing the same thing but not wanting to sound crazy. We went out into the woods but found nothing. We decided to go to bed around 3 a.m., seven dudes in a giant tent. Not exactly ideal. We continued hearing the laughter, and each one of us slowly traded conversation for unconsciousness. I was the last to fall asleep. I could barely cover my eyes until dawn. Daybreak is slow when you're under that much canopy and brush. We were all up and stirring a few hours later. We packed up, talked about the night, and went home for a good shower and a nap. I tried to go back a few years later, but someone had bought the land and blocked it all off. Strange trails. I was hiking with some friends in the Cascades on a fairly remote trail that was owned and maintained by a little backwoods community in the mountains. It was a gorgeous spring day, we had a good time and were in high spirits, and then, several hours into the woods, we found a balloon, a shiny helium happy birthday balloon, tied to a log in the path. 
It was almost entirely deflated, but not quite. This was a little weird, but obviously just someone's idea of a joke. We kept going and a few hours later found another one, it's your day, also tied in the center of the path, a lot more deflated. It was getting dark at this point, and even though it was obviously just a prank, we were a bit creeped out, so we headed back. Naturally, we got a little lost and wound up on some guy's property. We were going to go ask for directions, but then we noticed that he had a scarecrow strung up by the neck in his front yard. The door opened, and a guy straight out of deliverance stepped out onto the dirt, so we booked it back up the trail and eventually made our way back out. I'm pretty sure we narrowly avoided some kind of ritual murder up there. Algonquin Park My family owns a lake in there, and we have a small moose cabin on the property. There have always been campfire stories of skinwalkers and that, but I always thought it was just Papa trying to scare us until one night I went out fishing just before dark to see what bass I could catch. I had no luck, but on my way back, as I was rowing towards the dock about 250 feet from me, I saw a twisted man with a black wolf pelt on his back and a huge smile with weird tears of black owls. I guess she was following me along the shore, letting out a grunt of yelps. I got halfway back. I looked again, and it's gone. I was a young kid. So I shit myself scared and row back and told Papa, and he said it was my imagination, but later that night I saw two orange eyes glowing in the dark, and I thought at the time it was a headlamp, so I yelled who was there, and just after I heard a soft but rough voice say back, hot earth, and then I saw it dart away, and it was the thing I saw while fishing, and since I screamed, I woke everyone up, and after my papa explained that they walk the land and not to go out at night alone, that's all I can say, and if you don't know, there was some satanic stuff that went on there. My boyfriend and I went backpacking in New Hampshire two years ago and saw a red light in the middle of the night, and to this day I still can't explain it. I've backpacked all over the world on my own and as a guide, and this is the only weird experience I've had that I simply can't explain. We slept in hammocks right next to each other and had gone off a random part of the trail to camp further back in the woods, making sure we were far enough off trail to not be seen by anyone hiking by. It was fall, and there was no trail to where we'd set up, so the ground was covered in twigs and crunchy leaves. Around midnight, I wake up and see a red light shining on my rain tarp, and I just about shit my pants then and there. Waking up like that, I went from 0 to 100 in terms of panic because I assumed someone was using the red light function on their headlamp to check out our campsite. I freeze and listen to try and not let whoever it is know I woke up, but the light fades within 15 seconds of me waking up. I try to wake up my boyfriend, but to no avail because he's a heavy sleeper. I scramble out of my hammock like a bat out of hell with my own headlamp and look all around for anyone and give my best intimidating call out of who's there to absolutely nothing in reply. We would have heard someone walking away with all the leaf litter, but there was no sound at all. We were 6 to 8 miles from our car, so our options were to go back to sleep or try and hike 6 to 8 miles in the dark to then drive home for 4 hours. We went back to sleep. At one point later in the night, my boyfriend said he'd woken and seen a flash of the red light as he'd woken up, but he didn't hear anything and just went back to sleep. It's creepy no matter what the explanation, and when I googled explanations for red lights in the woods, it took me to a bunch of Sasquatch forums, so I don't know, man. I wasn't able to find many similar stories to my own outside of the random hits from Sasquatch forums. I didn't camp for like a year and a half after that experience, it scared me so bad. I went camping at Taquamanon Falls in the backcountry a couple years ago, toward the end of August. My brother and I hiked in and set up camp at our site along the main backcountry trail without seeing anyone around. We cooked food and hung out by the fire when we realized we were in complete silence. Not just out in the woods quiet, but silence. Not a chipmunk or a squirrel, no grasshoppers or cicadas. We got spooked and headed to bed. I woke up at 3 a.m. to pee and walked out into complete silence and moonlight. I could see everything, but there wasn't a single sound or movement. It was like the whole world was paused and I was the only thing alive. Spooky shit. I went backpack camping with my slightly older female cousin in the mountains in Virginia. It took over an hour to get up to the only parking lot with access to the trailhead due to the road having more potholes than potholes. A lone car accompanied us to the parking lot. On our hike in, we passed a couple of fellow backpackers heading back to the car we saw, so we knew that as long as nobody else arrived after us, we were alone on that side of the mountain. I encountered a huge rattler laying in the middle of the trail that my cousin's Irish wolfhound decided to investigate and got a bit on the nose. He was fine, but it was a bit alarming. We got our sight set up appropriately, hung food far away, lots of firewood for the night, sub-freezing bags, etc. I had a great evening exploring and appreciating the beauty. I fell asleep relatively easily, given all the work we had put in to ensure we were well set up. 
My cousin wakes me up with reoccurring jabs to the ribs, lol. Did you hear that? She was whispering. No tiff I was sleeping. What did you hear? She shushed me and said there was something outside of our tent. My being a fatalist and all decided I was more interested in going back to sleep than I was with whatever was prowling around our site. It was 2 a.m. Probably a raccoon or a possum. Bring it on, bucko. I was about to put the ear plugs I had brought in my ears in when the most peculiar vocalization I had ever heard rang out. It sounded unnatural, almost like a computer-generated sound. It was loud. It sounded like a mix between a turkey call and cadence, almost a gobble, but high-pitched and warning in nature, like a big cat screech. I've spent so many nights in the deep woods all over the USA and have never heard anything close to that sound. I put my earplugs back in, relegated to the fact that we were probably goners. I didn't hear anything else while we were up there. I didn't see any other campers, either. Upon our departure, we went into the little town at the bottom of the mountain and hit up the market. I asked the locals about the call we heard, while feeling ridiculous attempting to mimic the call, and finally ran into a couple of old farmers who told us how lucky we were to hear what we heard. I guess whatever it is and the sound it makes is a highly sought after experience, although they couldn't definitively identify what the responsible creature was. We went home and searched online for hours for a soundbite that could help us out. Nothing came close. Super frustrating. I can still hear it and wish there was a way to recreate it so someone might be able to help identify what the heck it was. I went backpacking for one night in the Tinaway this weekend with my wife and two dogs. It was on a trail that isn't very popular, and we didn't see anyone else on the hike in or out. I had a tough time sleeping as we noticed a fire off in the distance, and I wasn't sure if it was something we needed to be concerned about or not. I dozed on and off for a few hours and woke up at one point to see the inside of our tent glowing red, almost like there were tail lights outside shining through the wall, the best way I can think to explain it. I often get bouts of sleep paralysis, which come accompanied by hallucinations, so I just figured that's what it was and went back to sleep. When we woke up the next morning, I mentioned my strange dream to my wife, and she said she saw the same thing. I feel silly asking this, but does anyone have any idea what it could have been? I thought maybe a plane was spotlighting the area to look for fires, but I can't imagine why it would be red. Is it possible there was a red aurora this far south and I blew my chance to see one? It is important to note that both of my dogs were sleeping soundly, and they are pretty aware of their surroundings, so I don't think it was anyone who happened to be walking by the trail. And I'm wondering if anyone has any spooky experiences to share. To this day, this is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me, and my best friend, who's been into witchcraft for a bit, suggested sharing it here and that y'all might have a bit of insight as to how I saw it. I am an ex-Wildland Saw crew with lots of experience in the woods. I spent the better parts of 2020 and 2021 living primarily in a tent out in the middle of nowhere for the majority of the week and saw lots of interesting and odd stuff, but none of that can really even compare. Growing up, I used to live with my folks directly in front of a green belt, which led into some pretty impressive fir and oak woods. In these woods were old logging roads from the late 1960s that would stretch for countless miles. Pretty awesome place to grow up near, and I spent countless hours exploring. When I got a bit older, I started taking my dog on evening runs out there. In late 2017, my senior year of high school, I was taking my dog on one of the logging roads that I had run and explored every inch of. When we rounded a bend, she suddenly and very abruptly stopped in her tracks and wouldn't move. She was the sweetest dog, she would have run up and tried to play with a bear if we'd let her, so this was very out of the ordinary. It was early spring, so the sun was still setting pretty early. It wasn't quite dark yet, but the shadows were definitely lengthening. I had never heard her growl the way she did. The fur on her back was standing straight up, and she was practically drooling. Mountain lions are pretty common in my area, so I was spooked, but sightings are all too few and far between. At a pretty good distance in front of me, about eight or so feet up a decent-sized fir tree, I caught a glimpse of what looked like someone peeking their head around the tree at me. I couldn't get much detail or features, but it looked pretty human-like, just kind of a shadowed figure. Once I caught a glimpse of it, it disappeared back behind the tree pretty suddenly. I was overtaken with an all-encompassing feeling of sheer dread. Not really terror or fear. Just like a sickening, horrible feeling. Like the sensation you get when you fall into a dream and suddenly wake up. Then it showed back up, peeking from a different tree, closer to me. I immediately felt like I was going to vomit, my ears popped, and my dog practically screamed. I've never ran so fast in my entire life. I have never seen anything like that again, not even remotely close. Or really even felt that way. I'm a backpacker traveling through the rural areas of the southern Philippines. 
This area is covered by either mountainous jungle or farmland and small villages. I travel with a small 125cc motorcycle, older than me but reliable and with very gentle gas mileage. The locals act very hospitable and friendly towards me, many of them never having seen a foreigner before. Many offered a place to sleep and dine, even though I insisted I had my own camping gear. As my trip wore on, however, further into the mountains, where the roads became worse and more cumbersome to drive, things changed. Wherever I went, the people seemed on guard or even totally riled up. The strange-looking foreign man traveling through their habitat didn't seem to be their main interest anymore. Many didn't even seem to notice me, I caught myself arguing and shouting over something. I deduced through the occasional use of English mixed with the local dialect that the issue was regarding missing livestock and, in one village, a missing child. In the last village I visited three days ago, I saw armed men patrolling the outskirts. They shouted at me, turn around Po, no safe jaw. It dawned on me that whatever was going on in this area coincided with my traveling through here, and I must be the main suspect. I panicked, accelerating away down the trail, and I haven't seen civilization since then. I had not refueled or refilled my water and food supply for two days since I darted away from the last farm. The night that followed will forever haunt me. I set up my hammock and down some pastry that was about to go bad. I knew I just had to follow the trail, it did a large loop through the rural province, and I was about halfway through my journey. Then it happened, loud, so very loud. Walk walk, walk, walk. My body froze. The sound was definitely coming from nearby, but I couldn't pinpoint from which direction. I was frozen in my hammock, I felt paralyzed. My only weapon, a knife, is somewhere deep in my rucksack. I knew I had to reach for it, to face whatever was making this sound. Walk, walk, walk walk, walk, walk. The sound grew fainter, now I heard it coming from the south, from where I had come along the path. Then, silence. I jumped out of my hammock, grabbed the rucksack, and jumped right back in the hammock. The rest of the night I spent in fear, looking at the stars, and listening. When the sun finally rose, I rode my motorcycle as fast as I dared eastward along the path, soon it would curve south. I knew it. And it did, relief filled me until nightfall fell again. Walk walk, walk walk, walk walk. It was fainter now and died out sooner than the night before. I had left behind whatever was making that sound. When morning came, I darted away again until my motorcycle's reserve tank ran dry. I left it behind, it had been cheap, but I hung myself up on not getting it refueled at my last encounter with people. I hiked on, and that's when I found the hill I'm sitting on right now. I can see lights in the distance, it looks like a small city. It looks like a one-day hike to reach them. It's silent. I've heard nothing this night. I write here with great relief. Somehow, though I got this strange feeling of being watched, I must have been shaken from the night two days ago. The sound is the only thing you'll have to go by, I'm afraid, as I didn't see anything even though it was so close to me. Now I will sleep in peace for the first time in three days. After talking to a couple of locals and online people, I came to a conclusion about what it was. That's a wok-wok. The wok-wok is a vampiric, bird-like creature in Philippine mythology. It is said to snatch humans at night as prey, similar to the Mananangal and the Ikek in rural areas of the Philippines. It is also believed that this monster is called wakwak due to the sound it makes when it flaps its wings while flying. This sound is only heard when the wakwak is hunting and grows softer the closer it gets. If the sound of the wakwak is loud, it means it is far away, but if the sound becomes faint, the creature is close and about to attack. The wakwak is often described as having long, sharp talons and a pair of wings similar to those of a bat. It uses its talons or claws to slash its victims, get their hearts, and sometimes tear their bodies apart. Its wings are also said to be as sharp as a knife. Maybe fend it off with garlic or salt. A buddy and I were camping in the backwoods of the Idaho mountains, pretty far from everyone in the middle of the week, the nearest town is like 600 people an hour away. We got camp set up around 7, and we got a fire going to cook hot dogs. We're just chilling around the fire, and when it gets dark, we're snacking on things like Cheetos and stuff. As we talked, we heard branches up the mountain cracking. Like stepping on bushes and stuff. We stop talking, and the noises stop. We're a little unnerved, but we brought guns to go shooting the next day, and we've got a pretty big fire going, so we start talking again. The rustling gets closer, like something or someone is moving down the mountain. We stop talking, and the noises stop again. This happens like twice more. We talk, something or someone moves closer. We stop, and the noises stop. Finally, when whatever or whoever it was was like 200 feet away in the dark, 
I grabbed my rifle out of the truck and put a shot into the air. Whatever it was hauls ass up the mountainside in pitch black. Like, we're talking about 400 feet in 30 seconds. I don't think it was like an elk, bear, or cattle, it was super eerie. It knew to stop when we stopped talking. But I don't think it could have been a person, it moved way too quickly up the hill in dense brush in pitch black. We've not gone back there since. I was 6 or 7 years old at the time, so this is obviously a somewhat distorted memory by now, being that it was over 20 years ago. Anyways, I used to live in a trailer park, in Florida, that was heavily wooded behind the house, and I would frequently go out into the woods and explore or play mostly by myself. One day, I'm almost positive that I had taken this pathway before, but this time it was different. I felt a presence, almost as if I were being watched by something. While on the path, I came to this clearing, that I'd never encountered before, where the tree line ended and it was a small open field. Leading to the field, there were strange markings on the trees, and in the field, there was what I've always thought or remembered as almost a stone cottage, but really it was maybe just a 10 by 10 square shaped pile of like cobblestones. When I saw it, I froze with fear, and everything went completely silent. I immediately turned around and made it back to the tree I always used as a marker to make it back to my backyard area. While I did that, I saw, felt, or kind of heard this shadow type thing fly over my head, and I promptly ran the rest of the way back to my house. I've always attributed this to it being a witch in their home that I saw. I took the same path afterwards, because I still played in the woods after this happened, and never encountered this clearing again, nor the markings on the trees. If anyone sees this and has any insight or similar experiences, please share. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington, near Mount Reiner. Like, not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night, I woke up and heard something. I opened my tent, and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been right outside my tent. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple feet from my tent. No bag, pack, or anything with him, just a guy. He saw me open the tent, his eyes got huge, like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence and a guy that was probably high or something and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away in totally random directions that nobody could take the same path as on accident, I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness, someone was like, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no. I don't even think that's a real place there. They kept talking just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, aim that away, and, kind of spooked and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person. I did. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer, so I shined my light that way again, and it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days because there is no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as that wilderness is. There is no possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark, so I stopped quickly after probably only 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off, because the only way he could have been in both places was specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was over very early in the morning and hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail, and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really cannot describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, twice I heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside my tent, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided it sounded more like a human making animal calls. It could have actually been an animal, but I didn't actually see the guy again but it really sounded like a person making howling noises. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to the car. The relief was so strong. To this day, it's probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were, and I have no way of getting an explanation, but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. When I was 15, we lived on a 5-acre property outside of a small town, surrounded by woods that I regularly explored during the day. I got into a fight with my parents and ran out of the house, hiding behind a hill in the backyard, until I saw them get into the vehicle and leave. 
I then entered the house, went to my room, grabbed a duffel bag that I was storing supplies in under my bed, added my pillow and blanket, and left again, grabbing my bike. I then walked into the woods through my usual path at the back of the property. I went to my usual place, an old house, well, the remnants of a basement, to what was once a house. Supposedly of a family of cannibals who had killed a bunch of people in the area and were burned alive when they were caught, and then their house was torn down. I set to work turning the large circle hole, about five feet deep and lined with bricks, into my shelter. I didn't complete the roof, but I figured I would get to that the next day. I didn't build a fire. I grabbed my blanket and pillow to lie down shortly after dark. Just as I'm about to fall asleep, I hear a twig snap and promptly sit up. I calmed myself down, assuring myself that animals step on branches and stuff too, and I was overreacting. Just as I'm about to drift off again, I hear someone ringing a bell. I sat up, threw my pillow and blanket in my bag, and walked out of the woods, leaving my bike behind. This time I went out towards the highway, which was a considerably faster way to exit the woods. Parked by the barrier were three cars, adding confirmation that humans were in the woods for an unknown reason. I walked quickly down the highway to our house and went inside to find that we had visitors. Technically, they were there because they were helping my parents look all over town for me. LOL. No one thought to check the woods. I put my bag down while I found out the details of the search and received my parents' lectures for scaring them. I was sent to bed, and I had to come back down to get my pillow and blanket. It was then that everyone paid attention to my bag. The main guy who had helped them even looked in and was surprised by how prepared I was to live in the woods. I had dishes, pans, a hatchet, and a shovel, along with spare clothes and other random stuff I don't recall. I never entered those woods after dark again. Found out shortly after the ghost story attached to the remnants of the house mentioned earlier. I never admitted that that was my special place in the woods. A scary, true story happened to me. I lived at the edge of a national forest in the southern US. We used to have a huge problem with armadillos digging up my mother's garden at night. So our solution was to go out every night with a shotgun to handle them. One hot summer night, I came outside and did my usual walk around. As I was nearly at the back door, everything went silent. Not the silence of a hot summer night, but the dead silence of every animal in the area going dead quiet all at once. I was immediately on edge and began looking around in the dark, the flashlight on the shotgun cutting through the darkness. Then I pointed the light at the tree line, about 50 yards away. What I saw still haunts my dreams if I think about it too much. It was a set of glowing red eyes. Now you'd think, oh, it's just a fox, deer, or coyote's eyes. These eyes were about four feet off the ground and more than a foot apart. On top of that, there was nothing attached to the eyes. No body, no shadow, just nothing. Every hair on my body went straight up. I've hunted hogs in the dark, been stalked by a mountain lion, and come face to face with a black bear but those eyes scared me more than all the others combined. I raised the shotgun and fired a massive fireball, and the boom of the shotgun shattered the silence of the night. But the eyes remained, and this time the eyes or whatever they were attached to growled. It was a deep guttural growl that seemed to vibrate off your bones. I began firing as fast as I could, walking backwards towards the house. The eyes began slowly advancing. I reached the back door, threw it open, and flipped on the flood lights for outside. From the other side of the door, I heard an angry hiss like water being thrown into a fire. The eyes were gone, and though I didn't sleep that night, I never saw them again. I was on one of my first solo backpacking trips in the Spring Mountains in southern Nevada. My plan was to do Mount Charleston in two days, spending the night, then bagging the peak and heading down the next day. If you haven't been there, the trail is gorgeous. It winds up around the rim of a big valley before veering up to the summit ridge and offering just some awesome views. About two miles into the ascent, a faster hiker overtakes me. Rather than just nod and continue on, he stops and matches pace with me, and we strike up a conversation. Nothing particular was weird about what we talked about, but something was just a little off about him. He was too intense and too friendly. His charisma felt almost manic. Have you ever seen the interview with Tom Cruise where he talks about science? This dude was like that. Same kind of artificial friendliness. He was too type A, too glib. It was almost like he was imitating a genuine reaction. I recall him telling me that he really liked challenging himself but felt sick because nothing really felt hard or exciting anymore. Nothing really made him hard like it used to, to paraphrase. Well, Jabroni's vibe was really freaking me out, so I made an excuse to stop for lunch. The dude kept hiking, and I thought that was the end of it. I had an awesome rest of the day, and as I hiked, he slipped further from my mind. 
I found a gorgeous campsite on a promontory jutting off from the valley wall and settled in for the night. As night fell, as happens to all of us when we're alone in the backcountry, I started getting squirry as hell. Full-blown jitters, man. My mind kept jumping back to how weird that guy was and how he acted like something a regular human should act like. To make it worse, I was cowboy camping. Not even the dubious protection of nylon between me and the potential of seeing a smiley guy. So in order to ease my anxious mind before going to bed, I set my fixed blade knife in easy reach, right next to my head. I eventually got to sleep after listening to a few episodes of Mike Duncan's The History of Rome podcast. I slept unusually soundly, not waking once the whole night. When I woke in the morning, I felt unusually content and well rested. That is, until I went to grab my stove out of my pack. The location of my pack wasn't an issue. It was where I had left it, leaning against a pine about 5 feet from my pad. No, what really freaked me out was that every single pocket was open. All the zippers are unzipped. All the snap closures were unwrapped. The sleeping back compartment was open. The interior mesh compartments were open. The buckle closures on my stuff sacks were clicked open inside the bag. Nothing was taken, and the bag hadn't been moved. But literally every pocket was open. I wigged, dude. I had made sure they were all closed the night before. I'm fastidious with my gear. Someone had opened them. In panic, I looked down to where my knife lay on the ground, next to my pad. Sure enough, the snap closure that held it to its sheath had been snapped open. Let me tell you, brother, I set the ducking land speed record hauling asses off that mountain. I have always loved camping. There is something about being out in a tent away from electronics and everyday life that gives me a sort of reminder that I'm not totally dependent on civilization and phones to survive. I know that not bringing my phone is where I made my biggest mistake, but hey, it's Michigan. We don't have scary predators here that cause me to worry, and I knew these particular woods very well. I had never experienced anything bad before, so I figured it was a safe place to be. It was my younger brother Todd, my sister Amy, her husband Don, and me. All of us agreed, no phones, just tents, beer, and a relaxing time away from life. Well, I thought it was going to be relaxing. You can choose to believe what you will, but this did happen, and my life is never going to be the same. We all rode together in my sister's van and parked at the site we used to party at as teenagers. We even camped here a few times, but we had about five more people with us. Uck, the spider spot, really? Amy complained. When we first found this spot years ago, there was an old stump that was littered with wolf spiders. We burned it to the ground after waking up to big, nasty spiders all over us after a night of drinking. So we named it the spider spot. Come on, those stumps are gone, besides, it's only a quarter mile walk, and my feet have been killing me from work, Todd sighed. We all grabbed our shit and started walking the 10 to 15 minute walk, looking forward to the fire and, of course, beer. The worst part of the walk was the damn broken branches that seemed to jump out just to stab your face and break off. After we finally got there, we did the usual setting up of tents and grabbed firewood so the rest of the night would be filled with beer, laughter, and then bed after about 25 creepy nighttime pissing trips. It must have been around 1.30 a.m. when things started getting weird. Hey, did you guys hear that? Don asked, shushing everyone. We sat quietly, and after a few seconds, we heard the unmistakable sound of laughter. Just some other campers, man, probably doing the same thing we are. I answered with a laugh. Without warning, Todd shouted loudly to the people. Got any more beer? We all laughed and shushed him. We were having a blast and didn't think anything of it. Then we heard running. What the hell, Todd? You pissed them off. Amy started to panic a little. Don't worry, Amy, they are probably drunk and just wanting to talk, Don comforted her, but you could see the worried look on his face as the footsteps got closer. My heart was beating out of my chest, and I thought we were going to get into a drunken brawl. Got any more beer? It sounded like. A weird recording of Todd is only different. What the duck? All of the hair on my arm stood on end. It really creeped me out. Very funny assholes. Todd shouted. Then more running footsteps, only this time away from our campsite. Must be drunk teenagers messing with us. Amy breathed a sigh of relief. We all kind of nodded and agreed that it was time to go to bed. That was kind of a buzzkill, and I think it creeped us out a little. Hey, I'm sleeping in your tent, bud. Todd said it kind of with a nervous glance around the darkness. Coward. I said it with a laugh but was secretly happy not to have to rough it out alone. Once we were all in our tents, it was very quiet. It was the only time I can remember being kind of scared. 
I must have dozed off because I woke up to Todd shaking me. Dude listen. He whispered quietly. At first, there was nothing. Then I heard the most terrifying thing I've ever heard. It sounded right outside my tent, like a foot away. I'm sleeping in your tent tonight, Buo. Again, it sounded like Todd only did not like him. I was about to SHT my pants. Todd looked at me in horror, and I must have had the same look on my face because I was petrified. Then we heard the running again, and whatever it was, it ran off again. Let's hurry and get the duck out of here. Don shouted to my surprise. They must have been listening to whatever it was too. We all jumped out of our tents and ran back to the van as quickly as possible. I've never felt more relieved to be out of the woods. This was all last weekend and is 100% true. The worst part is that Todd called me and said he's been hearing something outside his house at night. He wants me to come over tonight, but I'm honestly afraid, too. I'm doing some research about the Ocala National Forest, where I live. I've been told that a lot of strange and unexplainable events have occurred here as long as it has existed. I started researching after walking my dog in one of the parks when we had our own strange experience. About a month ago, my dog and I took a walk through one of the dog-friendly walking paths near my home. About two minutes into our walk, I became almost overwhelmed with a feeling of unwelcomeness. My dog, after several hundred sniffs, stopped dead in her tracks as we approached a small land bridge. She, a fearless and energetic Alpha Pit Catahoula mix, sat down and stared at this vacant bridge for about three seconds, started whimpering, and led me with her leash as fast as she could out of the forest in the opposite direction. A dog who growls and chases after squirrels in the backyard, tried to befriend a sandhill crane, that lasted about two seconds before I discovered there was one in the backyard, has to be yanked back from snakes that she sees as a chew toy on walks, low growls, and barks if she can sense someone about to ring the doorbell. And an empty land bridge in the middle of a forest makes her whimper, running with her tail tucked between her legs, disregarding any potential smells we didn't sniff on the way in. I've never seen her that weirded out by anything. She doesn't like water and possibly associates the land bridge with water, so that could account for the whimpering. However, she has never done this on the docks we visited with water beneath. She just pulls me hard in the opposite direction, no whimpers. Tell me what you know. I love this mysterious and beautiful forest, but I'd like to know more about its history before returning. Let me preface this by saying that the area I was in. I know this area. It's a part of Pike National Forest, where I've been hunting almost every year for two decades. I know every draw, every ridge, every clearing and meadow, all bodies of water. I know this place. If you know the area, it's the loops out by Terriol Reservoir, a place where it's easy to get lost or run out of gas because the roads just go for ducking ever. A guy just ducking disappeared. I was doing some winter camping in March in Park County, Colorado. I use quotation marks because it had been unseasonably warm and there was barely any snow around. I was taking Forest Service roads to get to my spot, and while the roads were a little wet, they were absolutely passable. I was driving a minivan and doing fine. I got to my spot, a campsite maintained by the Forest Service, a short road into a clearing with a fire pit, at around 10 a.m. the skies were a little cloudy, but there was plenty of sun, and it was probably 50 degrees outside. I got my stuff set up and then took a short hike with a rifle to go do some target practice. I did that, hiked back, got back to my van at around 1 p.m., ate lunch, and took a nap. I woke up at around 3 because I heard a vehicle hauling ass down the road near where I was camped. So if you're standing at that campsite, it's at the top of a hill with the road to your left going straight down the hill and then curving around it behind you and off into the wilderness, and the road to the right curving down the hill out in front of you to run up a little valley between the hill you're on and a hill in front of you, and then the road curves around that hill, with another hill, number 3, on the left side of that curve. It woke me up because there was no one else out there at all. I hadn't seen a single person either driving or camping since I'd left the highway, so hearing the truck was unexpected, and it was a ducking loud old truck. It hauled ass by my campsite, probably doing 40, which is pretty fast if you know the service roads out here, from the left to the right, down the hill, and over towards where it starts to go behind the hill opposite the hill that I was camping on. When it was probably 100 feet from going out of sight, it slid off the road and got high centered. The guy driving it just duck and got out, looked at his truck for a few seconds, and then bolted into the woods to his left and uphill number 3. I didn't even have time to get out of my van to make my way down to him to see if he was alright and to try and help, he was just ducking gone. This is when the weather hit. The weather out there can change completely in a matter of minutes, and a goddamned blizzard was about to roll in, but I didn't know that at the time. I got out and started hiking down to his truck, which was probably 400 yards away, and it was already snowing by the time I got there.
I mentioned that I hunted out here, and I started tracking the guy. The ground was wet, he left clear footprints, and there was noticeably disturbed vegetation, all that. I hike off into the woods after him, and after 100 years or so, his trail just ducking vanishes. The spot was in some pretty thick timber that didn't leave much room for undergrowth but plenty of exposed ground for footprints. It just disappeared. I started circling out from the last footprint, and. There was just nothing. I stood still, listened, and watched for a minute, nothing. You can't climb these shitty pines, there are no streams, rivulets, or culverts to hide in, no little hills or bumps to hide behind, nowhere to go. His trail just ducking ended. By this time, the blizzard had arrived. I went back to his truck and, not being able to think of anything else to do because I was so ducked up from how his trail disappeared, just closed the driver's side door and hiked back up to my van. By the time I got to my van, there was already probably 4 inches of snow on the ground. I didn't know what in the shit to do, so I just sat there in my driver's seat, staring at his truck, which I could barely see anymore, and waited. I fell asleep eventually and woke up cold as shit, then got my buddy heater going, got all snuggly and tucked in in the back of the van, and went to sleep. When I woke up, I just waited for the sun to come up. It was sunny and cloudless with about a foot and a half of snow on the ground when I got out of my sleeping bag and scoped shit out with binoculars, and there were footprints in the snow coming back out of the woods and all around the truck and then coming up to my campsite and all around my van. I didn't hear SHT all night. The footprints went back down to the truck and didn't go anywhere else. There was no one in the truck. It was a fun camping trip. I stopped at the gas station in Jefferson on my way out, called the ranger station, and reported it. They said they'd take a look took my phone number, and I never heard back about it. Two summers ago, I was out on North T with my cousin, and we were just relaxing at our campsite when we heard voices. They didn't sound like they were too far from us, maybe 50 yards down the shoreline or in the woods. I figured there was maybe a group on a campsite that we couldn't see. Not too long after, we got in the canoe to go for a little paddle. We paddled along the shore, and all the campsites around us were empty. This was at the east end of North T and was not close to any trails or portages. The closest group to us was about one kilometer away on an island, and it was in the opposite direction from the voices we heard. We didn't see anyone else paddling that day, but we both heard the voices. Another one, I had talked to the guy I usually rent canoes from about a particular lake, and he described it as very mystical. I took some friends there last summer, and without me mentioning what the outfitter had said to me about the lake, they all described it as mystical too. There was almost no wind all day, and at one point one of my friends was sitting down by the water on his own and started to think about his father, who had passed away earlier in the year, and a massive gust of wind blew across the lake. That was pretty much the only wind for the day. The water in the lake was also very weird. We all found it a lot more difficult to swim in than other lakes. It felt like it was just pulling you down the whole time. I, 27 female, went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 tenths beautiful. The second night I camped at a beautiful high altitude lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail, so there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon, and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy, mid twenties, walked by carrying a fishing pole and a small cooler. I didn't think much of it, but five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came and said hi. I said hi and went back to reading, but then, without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback by this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy amused tone like so you're just reading? And then looked behind me and noticed my tent and said, oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? I didn't say anything in response to this in particular, but it's obvious that I am, it's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him I was trying to be alone to get him to leave. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark, just drilling into me. I just responded with like, ahas or yep or something and just tried to pretend I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks a beer, lights a cigarette, and just starts blowing it at me. At this point, I'm so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon another hiker wandered by, and he struck up a conversation with him, and I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend to need to get water. I went to the shore and filtered some water super slowly and I saw him walk away to go sit with the new guy, which made me super relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent, and for 20 minutes everything was fine. I had the rainfly pulled back and was watching the sunset and loosely organizing my things when he popped out from behind my tent and stood maybe one foot from my door, looking down at me. 
He didn't say anything but just started laughing really creepily or fakely again. I asked, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I felt literally sick to my stomach and finally responded with something like, I'm taking a nap now, so have a good night, he laughed again, but luckily left. Later, I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name, at least what was written on his cooler, and where he said he was from while talking to the other hiker in my notes app just in case, and I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving camp that night but ended up staying and just leaving super early in the morning in case he came back. Normally, while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is that I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not that bad as you're reading it, but this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the backcountry. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, but hopefully somewhere far away from this dude. My husband and I spent the night way out in the northern woods, near a lake. There is a looped camping trail where you can rent a site out for a few days for a relatively cheap price. Each site is probably separated by 70 to 80 meters, so while you can somewhat see and hear your fellow campers, it's never enough to take away from the ambience. Once we'd set up our tent and gotten our belongings in order, we decided to get a fire going and have our usual go-to outdoor dinner of roasted hot dogs. The night was beautiful, the fire gave off the perfect amount of heat and didn't smoke in our faces at all, and for the most part, our neighbors didn't get too boisterous. By quiet hours, we bedded down and got in our tent to spend some time enjoying the serenity and peace, until I realized for some reason our tent was sweating from the inside. And then it started raining hard. We take our valuables to the car immediately and get inside to wait out the weather before disassembling the tent. Our nearby neighbors all realize the weather situation as well, and we see them pack up and ship out one by one. This leaves us very much alone. This is where it gets insanely strange, and to this day, Neither of us is quite sure what we experienced. Out in the distance beyond our sight, I see what appears to be a red light, maybe attached to a lantern. However, the way this light moves is completely inorganic. It doesn't sway or bob as if being held by a human who is walking around, rather, it snakes around in a perfect track and slowly comes closer and closer to our car. By this time, we've killed the headlights and are just staring at this spectacle with a mixture of awe and horror. My husband gets out of the car at some point and calls out in the rain to see if anybody is there. Lo and behold, the light disappears. This left a most bewildering and eerie feeling deep in my gut. Something did not feel right at all. Sixth sense tingling and everything. At my urging, he gets back in the car, and it doesn't take long for the light to reappear. By this point, I'm ready to leave, tent be damned. But my husband insists that if we're to leave, we have to pack up our tent because he doesn't want it stolen. So, I begrudgingly oblige, and while he stands watch with a flashlight, I get to work packing us up. I probably got it done in 5 minutes, maybe less. The entire time we were out there, we didn't see the red light. If we had, God, I don't know how I would have reacted, but I'm glad we were able to get our stuff and finally leave. So yesterday, me and my friends decided to go to Pluckley, the most haunted village in England, supposedly. It was a lovely little town, and we had a nice time in the village itself. After which, we made our way to Daring Woods, nicknamed the Screaming Woods. And I will say that, as far as forests go, it was a beautiful place with lush green fauna and a dense landscape, but beyond the beauty of the forest lied a darker and more sinister look to us. In 1948, 20 dead bodies were discovered in these woods, making them very haunted, supposedly. We pulled up outside in the parking lot and got out. We walked around the gates to the entrance, and a man with a dog walked past us, but my friend Kyan is convinced he saw a woman walking the way we would soon go, no one else saw her. Keeping this in mind, my friend Kyan is a very honest and trustworthy guy. We kept walking deeper and deeper into the woods till the path we were on became overgrown and signs of human activity seemed to dwindle faster and faster. We then kept hearing what was a woman mumbling off in the distance, weird but not paranormal. We hiked deeper and deeper, and we were off trail now in the deepest part of the forest. This was when we asked, is anyone there? Please make yourself known, and I couldn't lie about this. If I tried and all my friends heard it, we heard a woman, maybe 30 to 40, whisper something unintelligible about 30 or so meters away from us. We all froze, and our hearts sank. We just made a beeline for the trail, not knowing we were running deeper and deeper again. We were lost at this point, and the feeling of unease had set in for us. All the constant thumps off in the distance and the whispers seemed to get more frequent. We wanted out at this point, so we kept searching for an exit. While we were convinced we were being followed, we made it out, and were all okay, but definitely a scary experience. Just to clear up, there was no one in the woods with us. 
the guy who drove us there stayed in the car for the three hours we were gone, and he said no one entered those woods while we were in there, and the man with the dogs left an hour after we went in. I need your opinion on some occurrences while camping last week. Adirondacks. I have just gotten back from camping up there and had a great time, but we ended up having a few small things happening that now, after the fact, make me pause. I think if these things had occurred by themselves or before I had any concept of Bigfoot, I would not have given it a second look, but now I wonder. Nothing odd happened the first few days, except seeing a distinct lack of animals, especially squirrels, chipmunks, and birds, which is odd for a campground since they are usually all over the place. Although they eventually returned later in the week, the third night, I woke up around 3.30 am I lay there for a few minutes, trying to fall back asleep, until the sound of something rustling around in the camp next to us startled me. Nothing weird at first, it could be a raccoon. Until whatever it was, they started rapidly trying to open the locked door to their truck. Pulling the handle very fast in quick succession. I figured it could be that guy getting something from his truck, but the thing is, I never heard the door to the camper open before or after, which I would have since it was quite squeaky. First on my mind was, O-S-H-T, it is a bear. So I sat up and dinged my metal multi-tool on my metal water bottle since they hate metallic noises, and the noises completely stopped. I never heard anything leave or run away. Odd, but I put it off as nothing. Funnily enough, the next day I was riding down the road, which is bordered by forest on each side, when out of the corner of my eye I caught a human-like form. I said no, it couldn't be, until I realized it was a life-size plywood cut out of a Bigfoot. I learned that the employees of the Nidec, who run the campground, put it there as a joke and apparently move it around every so often. Later that day, I was talking to our neighbor at the campground and his kids and mentioned it. The father laughed and said, oh yeah, I've seen it, funny, huh? Then his eight-year-old chimed in and said, yeah, I saw it too. I heard it make a noise, and it ran away from me. Both myself and the father chalked it up to a kid's imagination. The next day, I was out fishing on my kayak at a small point of land across the lake from my campsite. There are no campsites over there other than one single unoccupied site on the left side of this point, the other side is just forest. Before I started fishing, I had landed at this campsite to go to the bathroom since no one was there. I finished up and went over to the right side of the point in my boat, where the fishing was good. I was probably about 15 feet from shore when I heard the sound of a thump like something hit the ground and then a very loud snap like a large branch being broken. There were no other sounds after that, and I stayed fishing there for approximately 30 minutes. Keep in mind that there was not an ounce of wind that day, the lake was like glass. Again, odd, but I shrugged it off. Also, sporadically throughout the week, I would catch whiffs of a very bad smell that seemed to come and go without reason. It was like a dirty men's bathroom that hadn't been cleaned in 10 years, mixed with mold. I thought it was some of the big rotting mushrooms that were on the edge of our campsite, but after investigating, I decided they were not the cause, they barely had any smell. We were not near any of the bathrooms, either. The last thing, which I did not experience, was a family member asking if I had heard a sound early in the morning on the sixth day. I had not, I was sleeping, but I asked what it sounded like, and he, being a very avid outdoorsman and having been going to this campground for almost 60 years, said it was like no animal he had ever heard. He described it as a howl that turned into a raspy screech. I had heard a loud owl earlier that night before I fell asleep, but nothing like what he said. We left the next day. One thing that was interesting to me was that there were park officers going around to each campsite, telling us to be careful and keep all of our food in the car because a bear had been sighted 12 miles away. In all the years I have been here, I've never had the park officers be this stern. Most years, they have bear sightings and warnings, but usually they are just mentioned when you check in, along with a sign posted at the bathrooms and the entrance gate. I have my own ideas about all this, but I am still on the fence, these could be easily written off as normal stuff. Help me out here. I need other people's opinions on this. I certainly do not want to jump to conclusions. Most fearful and unexplained. I had what writer John Keel called a zone of fear incident on the Laurel Highlands hiking trail in SW Pennsylvania. Which, from what I read, is a weird part of the country. On a mostly sunny, warm summer day when I was having a good time on the second day of an attempted through, suddenly I entered this area, where I was gripped by horrible fear and dread. Worse than being threatened by bears, and not like fight or flight, but a real existential, bone-chilling dread. It came out of nowhere as soon as I entered the landscape and took a look around. The feeling of impending doom was so bad that I considered backtracking to a road and hitching out of there to the nearest town. I looked around with intense scrutiny but didn't see anything remotely threatening. Eventually, I convinced myself I was being silly and forced myself to go on, 
but it wasn't easy. Probably less than half a mile later, when I was away from the area, the fear suddenly stopped. There were a couple of other interesting things that happened on that hike. I never finished that trail, and I don't think I'm going back anytime soon. I recall an incident, roughly 10 years ago, when I was taking a stroll in a nearby nature area close to an ex-girlfriend's apartment. I'm not sure, but I do believe that it was autumn at the time. This nature area consists mostly of leafy and pine trees. Throughout those parts, you could also, although not often, stumble across remnants of old buidlings, farmsteads, mostly. The number of paths and trails was seemingly endless, and by the time this incident happened, I had more or less explored most of them. However, I did manage to find a small trail that I had yet to check out. It was more or less dead quiet. The woods on either side of the path were dense and dark. This in itself was nothing rare. In fact, I have, over the years, explored several similar places. On occasion, you would run into one or two hikers, and once you did, you would shoot a quick hello and then be on your way. After a while, I saw someone up ahead. However, the person did not walk towards me. Instead, he, I could tell by the stature and build, was just standing there, perfectly still, looking at something further up the trail. He was dressed in a black rain jacket, dark jeans, and trail shoes. I noticed that he had his hood up, which wasn't all that weird as it had started raining, albeit very lightly. Since I didn't want to freak him out or take him by surprise, I made sure to put more weight into my steps, snapping twigs, etc. However, he never responded. He just stood there, as if he were fixed to the spot and couldn't possibly move. It didn't bother me too much, although I did find it a bit strange. I decided to proceed, and once I came up alongside him, I said hello and then just moved on so as not to bother him. He was probably in deep thought and didn't want to be bothered. Eventually I reached his destination, greeted him without facing him, and proceeded to pass the man. I got no reply, so I figured that he just wanted to be left alone. At the same time, something felt off. I can't put my finger on what, though, but some unknown force, curiosity most likely, made me want to stop and turn around, maybe to make sure that he was okay? I can't really say. To my surprise, the man was gone. I kept looking around, but I couldn't see him anywhere. If he'd walked into the trees, I would have heard him due to how dense the woods were. Also, there was no way that he could have made his way out of sight by using the same trail as me. I mean, I turned around after just taking a couple of steps. There's no way that anyone could transport themselves that fast without making a sound. Still to this day, I have no idea who that person might have been, but after that, I stopped exploring uncharted trails ever again. My fiancé and I hiked into some forest in Ontario. We had a friend drop us off at the side of an old logging road in the middle of nowhere, and we hiked into the woods due east. The road ran north slash south, so basically all we had to do was stay due east hiking in and due west hiking out, and we would reach the road again for our rendezvous at a predetermined time a couple of days later. There are no natural predators this far south, such as bears or wolves, so for protection, I only brought a K-bar knife and some bear spray, in case coyotes took an interest in our two dogs that accompanied us. The logging road was no longer in use by any industry, and we had hiked into the woods for a few kilometers, so the chances of running into another human were nil. In addition, hunting is not permitted in the area, and there is no water nearby for fishing. There really wasn't any reason for anyone else to be out there in the middle of the woods that far off the road. No cell service, although I did bring a flare gun and multiple flares in case we ran into trouble to signal for help. No GPS, just a compass. We were careful hiking in and didn't do anything risky to avoid injuries in this remote place. It was early fall, but it was unseasonably cold. Well below freezing. There are lots of leaves on the ground and still on the trees, but no snow yet. We set up camp in some thick woods. You could barely see 50 feet away, the trees and bushes were so dense. We were totally isolated and felt completely safe. It was so cold and so dark at night, it was moonless and cloudy, that we went to bed early to stay warm. I'm a heavy sleeper, and the next thing I know, I'm awakened by my dog pawing at my face. It is pitch black, and I can't even see him. I go to pet him, but something is wrong. As I touched him, I could feel his fur standing straight up, and he was completely rigid, facing the door of the tent. He was clearly on guard and very alert. At first, I assumed there was a woodland creature nearby, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. That is unusual because I often camp alone with no problem and I'm not easily spooked. My dog and I just stayed there, frozen and alert, for at least a couple of minutes. My fiancé and other dog were still asleep next to us. It was 3.30 am, I checked my phone after the incident. The fire was out. 
No moon. Complete blackness. Just as I was letting my guard down, I heard the most unexpected thing, a notification going off on a phone just outside of our tent, maybe 15 to 20 feet away, and I saw a faint glow. I hear a male voice mutter oh duck or something to that effect, and I hear them running through the leaves away from our tent. They were clearly smacking into tree branches, etc., and swearing as they did so. At this point, they turn on their flashlight as they run, and I can see the beam flailing wildly around in the woods, occasionally back onto our tent. The dogs start going ballistic. I grab my knife and look at my phone, it's 3.30 am. I screamed out, if you come back here, I'll blow your ducking head off. I'm assuming he had a satellite phone or really good cell service to get a notification like that. The other weird thing was that he fled deeper into the woods and nothingness, not west towards the logging road. Needless to say, we packed up in the cold and hiked back to the road, watching our backs the entire time. We just walked down the road towards far off civilization until we ran into some other campers set up right next to the road, 7 or 8 kilometers away from where we came out of the woods. It was just after first light, they let us use their satellite phone, and we called our friend to come pick us up a day early. Upon hearing our story, the campers decided they would pack up as well and get out of the area. Lesson learned. I do not camp in the wilderness anymore without a satellite phone and a 12 gauge. On October 12, 2018, I wanted to share my love of the Adirondacks with two friends and introduce them to hiking in the high peaks. We had planned to hike the McIntyre range, but the weather had been rainy and the trails were running with water. Having been unfamiliar with hiking on Adirondack trails, bouldery and slabby, and the general adversity that comes with Adirondack trails, my friends were miserable from the get-go. I prodded them up to the final ascent of Wright Peak before they decided enough was enough and would not continue. I reluctantly accepted it before quickly summiting an icy Wright Peak, and we headed back down, abandoning Algonquin and Iroquois. When we reached the trail split for Wright slash Algonquin, we met two hikers who were more than eager to know our itinerary. One led with prodding questions, while the other just stared at us unwaveringly, coldly, and completely dead-eyed. It was chilling. The question asker asked us where we were coming from. We told him that we were hiking out because the wet rocks were too sketchy. He later asked where we were staying. We answered Wilmington. He then insisted on knowing where specifically and would not remit anything less than that. Meanwhile, his partner was still staring through us with his lifeless gaze, never saying a word. Something felt incredibly off and terribly wrong, even for me, who does not readily pick up on social matters. Instead of answering any more questions, we gave them the excuse that we had to keep moving and continued on downward. Before we were out of sight, the question asker yelled to us, be careful. It's not those sketchy rocks you have to watch out for. It's those sketchy people. We hastened our pace at once. Perhaps those guys were just messing with us. If so, they did a very, very good job. On the other hand, I'll never forget the look that other guys stared at us. It was just plain wrong. Be careful out there, folks. It was late in the day in the backwoods of Idaho. My brother and I were deep in the sawtooth range and were laying down waterproof tarps to prevent water from seeping into our sleeping bags. It was a beautiful evening, the sun was setting over the sharp ridged mountains all around us. We were surrounded by firs and pines, whose smell permeated the air. The remaining light was fading when we were done setting up camp. The first stars began to glisten in the night sky. Straight out of trees, I swear. With this remaking light, I noticed something sticking out at an awkward angle from behind a tree near the edge of the light our now lit campfire was giving off. I walked over and gave it a pull. Out came a World War I shotgun. I knew this because my great grandpa had served in the war, and it looked exactly the same. After we investigated further, we saw there was a pile of early 20th century items in what was left of a rotten sack. We took the items and piled them near our packs, intending to take them with us in the morning. When getting ready to sleep, we heard a bunch of weird sounds around us. In the middle of the night, I awoke to something wet on my cheek. Dazed, I sat up and felt it hit my face again. Slowly, I turned my gaze upwards and saw a rabbit in the tree above me with its entrails ripped out. We left immediately and didn't take the stuff with us. This still kind of makes me tear up thinking about it, because it was just so creepy and blood-curdling to me when it happened. Me and my buddy were on a week-long mountain biking camping trip, with all of the supplies we needed loaded on our backpacks. Anyway, I will keep this short just for ease of reading. The first night, we logged about 70 kilometers, keep in mind, there were lots of trails and we were pacing ourselves, and set up camp. Cooked ourselves dinner on a fire and all was good. We went to bed in the tent pretty early, as we had a long day ahead of us the next day. So while we are lying there, we start hearing howling from a coyote or wolf pretty close by. 
less than 200 meters, or so I thought, away from our tent. Ha, huh, definitely worth noting, and me and my buddy note to not go to the washroom alone or anything in case Teresa pack of dogs running around nearby. We both had knives and bear spray, and I had a three-bar extender, so we personally weren't all that worried about some wild dogs. We slowly fall asleep, and the howling continues throughout the night periodically. We finally wake up after seven hours of sleep, I can never get a full good night's rest in a tent, and we start out again to prepare for breakfast while packing the tent up. Keep in mind that soon after we woke up, we left the tent, and by then the howling had stopped. I didn't think anything of it, I just figured the wolf, dog, or coyote had run off during the night. We got the tent packed up before our water came to a boil, and I decided to go take a dump. I brought toilet paper, so I was going to be in bliss. I walk about 30 to 40 meters away and find a nice spot tucked behind a hill with some trees at the bottom and a nice creek going by. Ah, blissful. I drop my pants and pop a squat and I'm having a great time when, all of a sudden, I hear some slight rustling behind one of the trees 10 or so feet in front of me. I'm looking to make sure nothing's going to sneak up on me while I'm shitting, that instinct is hardwired into you if you're in the wild, and sure enough I see a piece of a leather boot behind this one tree, and above it I see pieces of green fabric. Nope. I pulled my pants up without wiping and ran backwards up the hill while still looking at the boot, tree, or whatever was behind it. I get to the top of the hill and I'm thinking about what the absolute duck is, but I pull my knife out of my cargo pockets and just stay there to gauge what was behind the tree. I moved along the top of the hill to get a different angle of the back of the tree. Sure enough, I get 10 or so feet across the hill and can clearly see the boots, pants, which I now realize are camouflage, and the rest of this figure. In my new vantage point, I start to see a camo jacket as well, and as I look to the head, at this point, I don't know if it's a corpse or what, oh my god, what the holy duck he was staring at me the whole time. This creepy old face with black stripes, like a football player, was glaring at me and fully acknowledging the fact that I knew he was there. I flared my knife to make sure he knew not to run at me, and I yelled for my buddy to come check this out. My buddy starts running over, and the guy just slowly backs off into the trees. My buddy gets there in time to see what I'm pointing at, although it was hard when the guy was camoed from top to bottom, before the guy slips out of range. I explained to him what had happened, and we clearly both had an uneasy feeling, so we went to get our SHT and leave the camp ASAP. We could always cook later. So we put the fire out and flew off on our bikes, and after putting 10 kilometers between ourselves and the camp, the mysterious old creepy guy was out of my mind. We probably only logged 30 kilometers that day because it was terrible backcountry and we were off-roading. We set up camp for our second night, cooked, and got ready for bed again. All is good. Wake up, do the same routine as the first day, but this time actually SHT in peace, and we also managed to eat our oats this time around. So we pack up and head off on our third day. We logged even less distance this day than the day before. It was really cliffy terrain, we had dry ground, and lots of energy was used per kilometer. We only made it about 25 kilometers that day. In keeping with our cycle, we do the same as we did the previous two nights. Set up camp, ate, and then got ready for sleep. We get in the tent, turn our lantern on for a few minutes just to chat before going to sleep, and then we hear it again. More howls. Pretty cool, actually, maybe by now we roamed into another pack's territory. Just go together if we go to the washroom and carry bear spray and knives. The howling continues for an hour before we fall asleep. We wake up at the crack of dawn, and to our surprise, the animal is still howling every so often in the morning. Better keep our eyes open. We do our morning ritual and prepare to leave the camp. The dog howls again, and this time I got a good idea of where the sound came from and actually could figure out the rough vicinity of where it came from. I was looking up a hill where I thought the dog would be, and sure enough, I ducking saw those same leather boots and camo slacks that I was talking about earlier. This guy is still staring at me, and you know what? The howl was coming from him. I SHT you not, that just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, so I hit my buddy and told him we were going now. He knew what was going on, so we got our bags, left the fire going, sorry, I didn't know if this guy was armed or what, and bolted. We decided to cut our trip short and make the journey back to our houses within the next two days. But the rest of the trip was completely uncomfortable because that guy had somehow tracked us through 50 to 70 kilometers of deep bush without us noticing, and two nights into our trip he was watching our tent while howling in the distance, so if he wanted to track us again, he probably could. It still creeps the duck out of me when I think about it. Who knows what his intent was. I had to hide from someone who was following me. I met him at a shelter the night before. I was hiking, tramping, in New Zealand, and he was doing this particular, popular, 
section. He kept trying to sit near me and made comments about my legs being too nice to be scratched up like that, ever go through gorse and shorts? Lol, among other things. I just got an uncomfortable vibe. He asked about my plans and itinerary the night before, including when I would be leaving the next morning, and I remained vague, packed my shit up, and slinked out like a cat burglar before anyone else was up. Thankfully, I didn't have to sleep near him. Strolling along a few hours later with headphones in, I hear or feel the vibration of rapid footsteps. I look back, and of course it's the guy. He stops running when I turn around. He's puffed out and has obviously been running for a while. He waved, and I waved back, following me for a while at a distance, until he power walked up to me, and the first thing he said was something like, you're quick, aren't you? I made polite small talk, and he said goodbye. He overtook me quickly, but slowed down to remain about 50 meters ahead and kept looking back at me. A few times he stopped, forcing me to pass him and try to start a conversation, and would then walk too close behind me. Eventually I asked if he could head on, I needed to pee, and I'd catch up. He walked away, and I walked on further up the trail slowly to make sure he was out of sight, then beelined into the dense forest and hid from him. After a few minutes, I could see him slowly walk back to look for me. He kept walking further back, and when the trail was free, I basically ran out, thankfully, I was packing pretty light. I pretty much jogged or power walked for hours and skipped a shelter to camp ahead. I didn't sign the logbook but asked a couple people going the other way to tell my friends if they passed them and not say anything if they saw this guy, and he asked. One of my longest days. Thankfully, it was a windy forest trail and hard to see into the distance too. He may have just been a very friendly or lonely person looking for company, but there was no way I was hanging around to find out. So to give you a little bit of background information on this story, which is 100% true. When this happened, end of September 2023, we were fairly new to the USA. I moved here a while back for law school, and so did my friends. We had been living here for a few months and decided to explore the nature of this beautiful continent, as we all live in NYC. So, long story short, we decided to go on a road trip to Canada, drive around Lake Ontario, and then drive back to NYC through upstate NY. I am a male, and my friends were three females, let's call them Lisa, Anna, and Charlotte. Everything went super smooth until the last night. So for our last night, we rented an off-grid cabin in a remote area in the woods in upstate New York. To give some locals an idea, we were like a half-hour drive from Harrisburg, I think. Me and Lisa had decided to spend one night in this cabin because it was one with nature. The cabin was super old and made from log wood, and there was no running water or electricity. Both me and Lisa had experience with survival in the wild in Europe. I had been a boy scout my whole life and even was a scout leader for a while. Our other two friends were, as much as I loved them, purebred city girls. They had pretty much zero experience with camping or just being in a place where there is no service for the phones, as was the case in this cabin. We had been driving all day to get there, and when we reached the beginning of the forest, it was already past 10 p.m., and it was really dark that night. While driving to this place, we lost internet connection with the GPS, and so I had to drive to the cabin on intuition paired with a good old-fashioned map, hoping for the best while trying to drive safe on these muddy trails, it was also rainy the whole day. On the way there, Anna and Charlotte were in the back of the car, and the moment they lost phone service, they got pretty uneasy for the rest of the ride. All of a sudden, in the pitch-black darkness of the forest, we all saw a campfire, but there were no houses around or people. Just a campfire, a well-organized one since the fire was not spreading and it was not as big as a bonfire. It kind of startled all of us, as this was a little bit weird since there was no one around and we were really deep in the forest already, plus it was getting very late. When this happened, we also reached the end of the trail, and we figured we had taken the wrong trail at a crossroads before. So I turned around, and we were on our way again. Half an hour later and a couple of wrong trails later, we finally arrived at our destination, as we could finally see the first glimpse of this godforsaken cabin in the middle of nowhere. To give you an idea of how old it was, the potty was made out of wood and was outside the cabin. When we arrived, it was still raining, and both Anna and Lisa were definitely not in the mood for getting out of the car and getting into a cabin with zero lights. So me and Lisa left the lights of the car on and went inside the cabin, while also using our phone flashlights, to check the cabin out and see if we could find any old flashlights, which we did, and to see if we could turn on the fireplace, which we didn't because all the wood was still wet from the rain and it seemed no one had prepared dry wood anywhere. So with a couple of old flashlights and a small improvised fire I managed to make in the stove, we all got in the cabin and I started to make some pasta for us. Meanwhile, the girls were preparing the beds and closing the windows since it was already cold in this part of the state. The cabin had a small ladder, 
which led to an elevated room or space with a bed where all three of the girls could fit in. And I would sleep downstairs in a bunk bed that seemed older than the First World War. While making pasta, Anna, one of the city girls, came up to me and, knowing that both Lisa and Charlotte did not like to hear anything scary at night, told me that she had seen an old cemetery in the middle of the forest on the way to our cabin and that she had seen a figure walk around there. I first laughed it off as nothing. As I mentioned in my previous story, I do not consider myself a big believer in scary stuff. Being from Spain, we take promises very seriously, to swear on God is very serious for us, and she swore to God that she was not lying. I told her then that I believed her but that there was no need to panic as I would lock all the doors when we would go to sleep. We had some pasta, managed to make a couple s'mores, which are lovely, by the way, and drank a couple beers, or at least I did, they all had just one. I can assure you that I am not drunk after a couple beers and that I would never start to hallucinate. Just saying, in case anyone thinks I saw stuff because of the beer. They all went to sleep pretty early after finishing the s'mores and their beer, and I, considering that I really love the outdoors and that I don't really mind a little bit of rain, decided to take my last beer and a flashlight outside to the front porch, also very old and made of wood, and sit myself down with my beer while enjoying the sound of rain and the lovely sight of not seeing a single light in the distance. I could greatly appreciate this coming from NYC, and I just scanned the area with my flashlight. There was really nothing much to see, besides a lot of trees and a small creek a little further away. All I could hear was the wind, the rain, and the running water down in the creek. That was until I suddenly heard what I would describe as a weird roar. The first thing that came to my mind was a bear. But I had researched well before our trip, and I knew bears were not common at all in this part of the state. I also know what a bear roar would sound like, and it did not resemble a lot, except for the fact that it was a deep roar, if you get what I mean. Startled, but not really scared, I continued to scan the rest of the forest for as far as I could see from the porch. It was then that my eye caught a glimpse of a figure, well hidden deep into the tree line. I would describe the figure as tall, as a reference, I am 6 feet 4 inches and I thought this thing was at least a foot or two higher than me. It was well hidden because it's brown fur, that is what I think it was at least, or the skin in any case, blended in well with the trees in autumn. It was definitely aware of our presence, as I saw two eyes glimpsing into my flashlight. I could not tell you what it was, but I swear to God that it was not a bear. It was bipedal and had rather long arms, I would say. We looked at each other for what seemed like an eternity, but in reality it was more like five seconds before it vanished behind a tree, and I heard another roar. It was then that I felt all of my hair stand up, and I was definitely very scared. I went inside as quick as I could and locked all doors and closed all curtains. I quickly went to bed and tried to wave it off as just my exhaustion, from driving all day, playing tricks on my mind. But I promise you, this was very real. After an hour or so, I calmed down and finally fell asleep. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the next morning, when I went to relieve myself after having drunk beer the night before, the weather had cleared and it was rather sunny, and as far as I could see, the forest was calm and beautiful. No sight of any animals or anything abnormal. We had a nice breakfast that morning and left on our way back to the city that never sleeps. And so ends my story of that night. I never talked about what I saw that night because I know all three girls do not like to hear scary stories. And I figured, after these months, that this was the best place to share it. If anyone has an idea of what it could have been, feel free to enlighten me, especially if it is backed up with rational reasoning. My husband and I had the scariest experience of our lives in Grand Staircase a few winters ago. We were camping at the trailhead of Coyote Canyon, hoping to get an early start on the hike in the morning. For those unfamiliar, parts of Grand Staircase are super remote. We set up camp, made dinner, and were about to turn in for the evening when we noticed a pinpoint of light coming from a single headlamp, maybe 500 feet away in the desert brush. We didn't see a single other car, human, or camp and hadn't for miles, so it was a little eerie. We assumed it was just another camper, though that would have been odd, given the location, like, why were they so far from the road or rail? But we didn't think much of it, so we got into our rent. It got dark, and my husband decided to go outside the tent and check on the camp one last time before bed. He popped his head back in the tent and whispered, the light is still there. Now that it was dark, it had become much more distinct. We were certain it was a headlamp, so since it was pointed in our direction, we knew it was looking at us. We both put our headlamps on and waved towards the light, saying hello. Immediately, the light went out. We kind of looked at each other, feeling super unsettled and wondering if we needed to GTFO in a hurry, when the light turned back on, but this time much closer to us. We waved again and said hi, and again, it went out immediately. We started freaking out, 
knowing it was approaching us slowly while turned off. This happened two more times and kept slowly getting closer. We grabbed our shoes and jackets and ran to the car, ready to abandon our whole camp. We pointed our lights at it a few times, saying, hi, what do you want? And then the light turned back on, even closer now, maybe 200 feet away? But at this point, it's totally blacked out, and we can't see the person. We get in our car and GTFO immediately. We left out a tent, sleeping bags, some gear, etc., but we were pretty sure at this point we were fleeing for our lives. The road we were on was a super sketchy, potholed, slick rock mess, so we couldn't do more than 10 to 15 miles per hour. As we drove off, the light followed us, clearly watching us leave. It took me 90 minutes to drive out and get back to where we had cell service in Escalante, and there were a few points where I had to get out of the car and open a cattle gate. We didn't know if we were being followed or what, but we were petrified with fear. We were able to check into a cabin in town we had rented the previous evening, and at this point it was probably midnight. We went to bed shaking, but hoping that we had been silly and overreacting. We were like, let's go back in the daylight and get out gear and check things out. We hoped we'd feel utterly foolish going back, and we hoped we had overreacted. We did the 90-minute drive again the next day, feeling like idiots and hoping our tent was still there. We roll up on the trailhead and see our stuff, undisturbed. We start to pack it up, all the while looking over our shoulders for some desert weirdo. We don't see anyone or evidence of a camp, but what we do find are big boot prints exactly where we had seen the light the previous night. Again, the prints were out in the brush, where no one should have been, because, if you're familiar, the dirt here is living dirt, and you're really not supposed to walk on it, why would you want to when there is a road and a clearing? We followed the prints and saw that the person with the light had been approaching us, though doing it wordlessly, and always turning their light off when we shined ours in their direction. The prints stopped at the point where we had last seen the light when we left the night before. Seeing that there really had been someone there freaked us out even more, because, like, where were they now? So we grabbed our stuff and got the duck out again, feeling more freaked out than the previous evening. We still don't know what happened or who was out there, but holy SHT, if you get a weird gut feeling about something, trust it. We honestly think we could have lost our lives that night to some lunatics. I've been a hunter since I was probably 13 or maybe earlier, I don't really remember but being out in the woods since I was very young means I get to see or hear things that I normally wouldn't while living in the cities. I've had a few different instances where I've been very creeped out in the woods, so I'm going to cover a few of them here, and the last story is one that you guys have likely heard. In my state, you've got a handful of primary predators out in the woods, bears, wolves, cougars, etc. I'll start with a funny one that will get you up. The guy who owns the land that we hunt on decided it was going to be a good idea to store some of his equipment on his land, one of which was a styrofoam float. One year, we went out there to check on that stuff and go pick it up, and that big piece of styrofoam met its demise with a black bear. You can tell if the bear had a hell of a lot of fun tearing up the styrofoam because the clouds were just tearing into it and throwing pieces of styrofoam all around, it was like a bomb went off. I hope that bear was okay, hopefully he didn't eat any of that, and we did manage to get it cleaned up. Now on to the first creepy, I was stalked by a cougar a few years ago. When we had a deer opener, I liked walking the road occasionally, and one of the first things I noticed that year, which I wish I would have taken a picture of, was a set of really big cat tracks. This cat was obviously stalking other animals in the area. But me being me, I decided that I shouldn't be scared of it because I would probably be more scared of me, but sure enough, I jinxed myself. I attempted to do a deer push through some of the really thick brush to try to scare up a deer and get it to move towards the other hunters in my party. I'm going to get that soon. As I'm moving through the woods, I can hear something moving behind me, and every time I stop, that noise will stop. Eventually I got really nervous, especially with the forest getting quiet, so I decided if I'm going to get attacked by something that's found on me, I'd rather be facing it, so I turned around and walked straight back the way I came with my rifle raised. When I began retreating back to where I came from, directly towards whatever was making the following noises, I saw a tan flash of fur and a long tail pretty low to the ground turn around and run away from me. Then, the next day, as I was doing a walk up the main road with my rifle, I was close to the tree line on the side of the road when I heard a deep growl immediately to my right. I turned my rifle up to see the face of a cougar at my stomach level because it was raised up on and out of brush and dirt. I calmly backed away, walked back up the road where I came from, and apologized for disturbing her. Now for wolves, one of my favorites and one I've got for you is short and simple. A few years ago, my dad shot a deer, and we gutted it. If anyone here is familiar with the field dressing of an animal, you typically leave your gut pile just out in the woods. This was like the year that we found out that there was a wolf pack that moved onto the property. 
So my dad leaves a gut pile a couple hundred yards from the stand. The day after, I was sitting in my dad's stand while he was doing a big loop on the property to try to scare deer towards me, as he was getting close to me, which I didn't know at the time. I was sitting in the stand, and I heard a wolf kind of yelp from the gut pile. I texted my dad and told him he better hurry up and get back because there was a wolf pack somewhere between us. Sure enough, by the time he made it back to me, he told me that he also heard the same thing, and it was within probably 100 yards of him. This year, just in November, I actually took pictures of some old tracks on one of the trails next to my size 13 boot. The tracks are huge, and I know there's one set of four that were walking together. The pictures I took are the biggest tracks, and I'd have to ask them if that wolf is probably 200 pounds or more. Now for the one that sticks with me. This is the one that I got for you that you guys might have heard before. Somewhere around 2006 or 2007, I was a late teen. I was at my grandparents' cabin with them and my cousin. This was the summer in northwestern Wisconsin, Danbury, to be specific. The incident happened midday when the sun was high in the sky and it was pretty warm out. My cousin and I decided that we would play some airsoft, and I was wearing camouflage and decided that I would have a better chance of not being seen and being able to ambush him by going into the woods, which was about an acre attached to the area where the cabins are off of. Well, it's miles of woods, but the acre is what my grandparents owned. What we did with the land that they own was cut trails in it in a big circle with one entrance that splits into Y and the loops around. This was used as a short ATV trail. As we were battling with the airsoft guns, we continued all the way up the trail, about halfway. We were both winded and at the top of a hill next to a clearing in the woods when I decided to mess with my cousin, shush him, and tell him that we were being watched. Now mind you, I intended this as a joke, but when we both got quiet, I realized the woods were dead quiet, like you could hear a pin drop. I could only hear my own breathing and immediately felt like we were being watched, so I looked in the direction of where I felt this from and scanned the edge of the clearing, where on the other side of the clearing there's another hill that goes down to a watering hole or a pond, so we would often see animals that were on the edge of that clearing, and they would usually run off, like deer and whatnot. But anyway, I scanned from left to right and then back, and halfway through the right to left visual scan, I saw white and focused on it. That's when it came into focus. The whites that I saw were teeth, teeth in the mouth of what looked like a wolf panting except for being really tall for a wolf, like to my stomach or my chest, and I am 6 feet 4 inches. As I was taking in these details for such a short time, I realized that this thing was just staring at us, maybe even more at my cousin to my left, and I also realized that this wolf was not on all fours but crouching on its back legs, leaning against a tree, with its arm wrapped around the tree. That's right, I said arm, this thing had arms like us and hands like us, except it had long nails or claws at its fingertips. In the short time that I looked at it, I took any information and sent it to my cousin, we have to go. My cousin took off like a bat out of hell, being a baseball player, he was faster than me. He ran. I looked back at the creature, and it locked on with laser focus. It took my cousin to stand all the way up and begin to run towards us, which is when I turned and ran. What I remember from when it stood up was that it was significantly taller than me when completely upright, and when I ran, I could hear it crashing through the woods behind me. When I reached the Y in the trail, my cousin was standing there waiting for me, and I told him to go go go. We ran into the parking area by the shed and stopped and talked about it because it sounded like it had stopped chasing us. At this point, we had agreed that not telling our grandparents that we saw essentially looked like a werewolf was probably not a good idea, and we agreed that we would refer to it as a bear. Unfortunately, my cousin never actually got a look at it other than just a flash of reddish-brown fur, but then again, maybe he is the lucky one because I still think about it from time to time especially when I'm out enjoying the great outdoors. I'm leading up to this, and even afterward, I always had a bad feeling, especially at night, that something was at the top of the hill in the tree line watching us. One of the things for you guys to memorize is that if you're out in the woods, if the woods go quiet, like eerily quiet, this sometimes means that there's a big predator in the area, and if you have a gut feeling, you should follow it. Gut feelings are instincts, and we have them for a reason. My instinct told me that I had to react immediately, if I had frozen, I would have died. I have one last thing to add, which is that a few years ago, when I was hiking with my wife in a local park, we got followed by an unknown animal. As we're moving up the trails through the woods, there is something tracking us, moving as we were moving and stopping as we were stopping. What made this weird and not feel like a normal animal was that the sounds that were being made were in the tree canopy. Whatever this thing was, it was moving from tree to tree, following us. And it sounded big. The reason I said this is because this is the thing that chased me and my cousin. People say that it's a dogman, and they say that they are intelligent and apparently good at climbing trees. 
I also say that these creatures might actually follow people around after they've seen them, so who knows? Maybe the unknown assailant that followed me and my wife was something similar to something that I had seen before. I like to look for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find backroads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip about 10 years ago, I'm in western PA, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out-of-way stream that I found on the map. I'm in the country, it's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I am really close to where this stream is supposed to be, so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction I believe this stream to be. The road starts out in good shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random spots on the road, first sporadically and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It looks like they were placed on purpose. My car is four-wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger, and when you combine this with how tight the road now is, driving around them is becoming sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly to not pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn but stop as I see the road continuing this weird downward trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around, but it's at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but I didn't want to get my front end caught on something pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck. I say to myself, keep pushing forward, and you are bound to get just enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way down this weird, downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it was just garbage, bottles, boxes, wrappers, etc. Then I started seeing toys. Kids' toys. There are lots of them. An uncomfortable amount. Then I started seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered, like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I started seeing mattresses. Not one random mattress. There are lots of mattresses. All over the place. There are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to go, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out my next move, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive in reverse, dodging all of the random rocks and all the way back up and out of the sharp turns until the path levels out again. I go full duck this mode and risk making the three-point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank, and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever Darkwoods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. The best case scenario was probably some deep wood meth den. All I know is that ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts telling me to get out, I get out. Back in the day, when I was in college, me and the youngest took off to a lake in the wilds of glacier country. I have extensive backcountry exposure, I even did a stint as a big game guide in a remote backcountry camp. On this day, we enjoyed the fishing and settled in for the night. I pulled out my pan and stoked up a nice fire. It was clear and cool as the sun faded into the western slopes. We cooked up some fresh rainbows with garlic and butter and filled our stomachs. I leaned back against the cooler after pulling out a refreshing beverage. The boy was soon asleep by the fire, as it had been a busy day. I sipped my beer and watched the moonlight bounce off the little waves in the lake. There was still a light glow on the western horizon where the sun had gone down, and I could see the outline of the mountain peaks towering over the little lake. I slowly faded off to sleep with the sound of the lake waves gently lapping on the rocks. I awoke with a start. The fire was out, and the lantern was out too. The moon was gone, and it was pitch black. Something was wrong. The hair on the back of my neck stood straight out. I was paralyzed. I could hear my heart thumping as I strained to hear something in the bush, all was quiet. I had a horrible, uneasy feeling. I gathered myself together and started kicking around the fire. A small flame came alive, and I quickly threw on some wood. In the firelight, I could see that the boy had awoken, and I was shocked to see his wide, open eyes staring at me. What's wrong? He asked. Nothing, go climb in the tent. I lied. He crawled into the tent, but even in the light of the fire, 
I couldn't shake my wariness. Something was out there in the bush, and I could feel it was watching me. I gathered up my light and flashed around camp. Nothing. Finally, I began to calm down and crawled in the tent with the boy. Then again, like clockwork, I awoke completely tense. This time, I couldn't shake the feeling at all. I finally instructed the boy to wake up and go get in the truck. I packed up all of camp, drove around to the other side of the lake, and slept with him in the truck. At dawn, I got up and looked across the lake where we were camped earlier, and another uneasy feeling came over me. I decided it was time to go home. I don't know what was out there or what was going on over there, but I know my instincts, and something was wrong with that place. Whatever it was, I will leave it to your imagination, it creeps me out to this day thinking about that night. Twice a year, I meet up with some dear friends of mine to go on a camping trip deep in the Amish country of eastern Ohio. It's located on several acres of private land and is used as an outdoor club. There's loads of hiking, swimming, fishing, firing ranges, and shelters. Some of them have electric, one even has bathrooms and a kitchen. Everything you could ask for, apart from showers. I've always felt really honored to have even been invited to this very special place. The kind of place you'd drive right past and think was nothing more than a gated path for farming equipment. If you notice it at all, it's the perfect place to unplug. There's no cell service for miles, and the nearest town is about a 20-minute drive, the night sky is absolutely incredible because of this too. Sitting near the top of a large foothill, the path beyond the gate descends surprisingly fast into a deep ravine before opening up into a big, secluded meadow surrounded by steep, wooded hills. There you'll see the shelters and ranges and a lake with a causeway leading back to a prime camping area hidden ever so slightly behind the tree line, mostly covered by a high canopy with an opening in the center for a large fire pit. We set our tents up around it and the small, open shelter that covers a vertical row of four picnic tables and the stack of firewood. I routinely hang my hammock in the same patch of evergreens on the southern edge of the tree line. Nothing beats falling asleep to the smell of fresh pine. Slowly rocked to sleep by a gentle breeze as it whistles through the countless clusters of long, delicate white pine needles glistening and dancing in the soft moonlight above, and if you're maybe having a bit too much fun, the soft ground below cushions the fall too. Perfection. Beyond the tents, you'll find some trails that lead further downhill. One takes you into a gully with little waterfalls and a creek connecting the lake to another, about a half mile or so from camp. You can walk around it, and at times we've even found some local Amish kids back there going for a swim. It's a really serene and still place with lots of neat avian wildlife, especially. I was at my friend's house when I first heard of a third lake beyond the second, and my ears instantly perked up. I'd been out there for years at that point and had no idea it even existed. Apparently the club didn't own it anymore since it's practically all marsh and nobody ever went back that far. I had various pipe dreams about my very own river monsters moment where I was going to catch a majestic, record-setting bass, walleye, or channel cat. Over the years, myself and many others have caught some incredible fish in other lakes, so this one was bound to be the mother load. On Labor Day weekend, my bags had been packed and gone over several times. I was ready to embark on the journey of finding this untouched lake. That Saturday morning at breakfast, we discussed our plans for the start of the day and where everyone would be. There were five of us adults and seven young ones, so twelve of us total. Despite that, everyone else was still pretty slow to get going, so they decided to head up to the shelter at the north end of the property to hang out, and I was on my own. Typically, I would tag along as we're on club time out there, but I was far too eager. Once I reached the second lake, I looped around it and was elated to find a deer trail that appeared to stay on dry ground. Vines and thorns galore, but luckily I brought my trusty panga, and I was hacking my through when I eventually got into some cattails after about 20 minutes of roughing it. They only went on for about 15 yards or so before they ended, and there I was, suddenly standing in front of this pristine, untouched lake, far better than I imagined. With the bright blue sky bouncing off of the mirror-like surface of the water and the bubbly, emerald green hills surrounding me, I was in paradise. As I said, I packed the bag at home and went over it a ton. I hadn't even opened it until I finally reached the lake. When I was digging through my bag, I started to feel disoriented. I looked through it constantly, forgetting what it was I was looking for and never really being able to find it when I finally remembered. Eventually, I settled on a setup that was less than ideal but enough. I figured I'd try my hand at it first before switching it up and sinking a line for some catfish. Thinking that would at least guarantee me a bite of everything else failed because of how abundant they are in the other lakes. After crawling around the rocky shoreline and trying various spots with various lures, I got nothing. Not even a whiff or a nibble. Nothing. I couldn't shake the haze, and I was becoming increasingly frustrated. To the point where I was becoming completely enraged. 
something that is not typical of me. At all. I decided my luck just wasn't with me, so I sloppily packed up and scurried my way back to the cattails. The closer I got, the more confused I started to feel. At this point, I honestly started to wonder if I'd been turned around and even began to worry about my health. I thought maybe I was having a heat stroke, but it wasn't even that hot, and I was plenty hydrated. I didn't drink any booze the night before because of my plans. Absolutely nothing could explain suddenly feeling this way. When I entered the cattails, my stomach turned instantly. The air was so putrid that I audibly gagged when suddenly something very large ran past me as if I had startled it. Even bumping into my left arm with some force, knocking the grip on my panga loose. I thought deer for sure but was spooked to no end. I couldn't, and I didn't see one, or anything for that matter, as I frantically searched around for the machete. Eventually, I realized that the only noise I was hearing was the noise that I was making. Everything was dead silent. Immediately, my hair pricked up, and as I stood up to assess the situation, I realized the sky looked weird. It looked as if I were standing in a clear chunk of quartz, or the dimensions were folding around me. It's really hard to describe accurately, but it didn't take me much time to figure it out. I ran, and I ran like my life depended on it. The roughly 15 yards of cattails felt like they went on for an eternity. Like I was on a treadmill, I was completely gassed by the time I reached the trees, but my adrenaline was so maxed out and my heart was beating so fast that I overdid it and got sick. I choked on my breakfast as it came back up. The sound of it was absolutely deafening in the silence surrounding me. For accuracy's sake, I'll even admit that, for a second, I thought for sure I was going to shit myself. I had become violently ill, and the thought of it maybe being enough to deter whatever was chasing me actually did cross my mind. At the same time that crossed my mind, so did so many other things. I realized I was, in fact, being chased. It had run weaving in and out of my path so fast I couldn't make out what it was, only the sound and movement of the brush gave away its location. How could something so big move so fast without me being able to see it? I thought as I barreled through the rough terrain. There were times that I felt like I could see it, but it was like it was translucent and bipedal. Like Harry Potter's cloak or, you know, a ducking predator. I didn't think that, of all things, it was supposed to be based on a true story. Eventually, I also realized I was getting pretty soaked, and some of it was too thick to sweat. I'd been running for so long now that the brush was slicing me up relentlessly. Eventually, I caught a good gash on my forehead and was having a hard time seeing. It's amazing how much we bleed from our heads when our BPMs are through the roof. I wondered if it was intentional. If I was being chased into some part of the woods I didn't know, I was being prepped for dinner along the way. I knew I was no longer on the deer trail that I initially took, and I was beginning to become really, genuinely scared that I'd never make it back. Finally, the other thing seemed to back off for some reason, and I got spit out on the far west side of the middle lake. A spot that I had never been able to access before. The only way I could see out was to swim across. I felt like something was going to pounce at any second, so I rushed to take off my shirt and tie it around my head before swimming across. Whatever it was, it didn't seem to follow me into the water. That didn't make that murky ass water any less scary. I grew up in and around salt water, and I know you should never go swimming in it when you're bleeding. I've never swam so fast in my life. I could have beat Michael Phelps, I make it across and stop to catch my breath. I didn't think I had any adrenaline left, and I could barely pull my weight off the mud. I was so tired. I noticed it was still so extremely quiet that I held my breath for a second to see if I could hear anyone at camp. I heard my best friend shout a few times from afar. Something was off, though, her voice was coming from the wrong direction. Like I said before, everyone was up at the shelter. I knew that. I know them. They'd never go anywhere as a group without me knowing. Maybe one or two wander back to camp to grab something or look for me if I'm taking too long but only in extreme situations we've otherwise never experienced, and it wouldn't be her that would go. It'd be her husband and our other friend, who are both experienced hunters and trackers. That's it. The rest stays put and waits. It's part of our safety protocols. Again, I hear my name being called. This time it sounds a little louder, still coming from the same direction. I determined that location, to the south and across the hollow on the opposite hillside, would be next to impossible to get to. The terrain is far too rough, and no trails take you anywhere near there as it's not our land. You'd have to drive all the way up the hill and off the property. Walk all the way across a massive field for damn near a half mile, and climb deep down into the woods from there. There's no chance you're doing it without repelling, and that's beyond any of our capabilities because we simply don't have the gear. Again, I hear her. This time, it sounded even more off. It rusted almost, and the third time she called my name, 
It sounded like it was being played out of a tape player. I mustered up what strength I had left and ran for my life. I finally made it back. Everyone got up like they saw a ghost. I forgot how rough I looked. After confirming I was okay, I explained that I heard her calling my name and asked if they had sent someone out to look for me. They hadn't. They never so much as called my name and assumed I was fine, saying I'd only been gone about an hour and a half. That's it. The weird didn't stop there. I got cleaned up, tried getting on with my day, and before night fell, I tore down my hammock and made a bed in my friend's tent. Luckily the weather was on my side, and I was able to blame the leaks in my perfectly fine rain fly. One of our group members, the eldest boy, was especially keen on the fact that I was still very disturbed by what had happened earlier. As I sat under the shelter wrapped in a blanket, nursing a beer, and watching the fire, I raged against the rain and darkness. It occurred to me that suddenly my little patch of paradise didn't feel so paradisical anymore and that only the two of us remained while everyone else was already nestled into their sleeping bags, I told him the full story. I probably shouldn't have, but I figured, why not? A good campfire story to scare the kid. I always enjoyed those when I was his age. As I told him the story, it began to feel as if something was circling our camp. We'll call him C. He sprung up and grabbed the rifle he had in his tent immediately. We tried going to sleep when the rain got too heavy to keep the fire lit, but neither of us could. At about 3 in the morning, yet another cliché, I know, we heard the most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard coming from down the gully. I looked over and saw that C had turned on his headlamp in his tent. I've heard bobcats, mountain lions, bears, owls, egrets, wolves, foxes, and coyotes. I know what noises these things make. They're horrifying in their own right, but this was not any of that. It was almost metallic sounding. Eventually daylight broke, and I got up the second I heard C stirring. We asked if anyone else heard the screams, they didn't. C and I went back to the third lake that day. I never did find any tracks other than my own. I never found the ponga either, and everything was just normal. Nature was alive and sounded it. I've been back many times since then, too. I never went alone, though. I won't, and I never sleep in my hammock anymore. There is a bit of an eerie vibe now that wasn't there before. It could just be me, but I don't think it is. In fact, I hadn't told this to any of them besides C and my best friend, and I only just told her a couple weeks ago. In the trip since then, my friends all eventually agreed that the camping area wasn't so prime anymore, and now we sleep in a closed shelter in the meadow area, a little further from the trees. So, we do a lot of camping. At least once a month for a long weekend, and two to three week long trips a year in Australia. Within the last couple of years, we've had some disappearances of people in the Victorian high country. One of them was from a couple that disappeared in the Wananata Valley. A very remote part of the high country. Some of the tales around how they've just completely disappeared came into the press, who, of course, listed all the people who have also disappeared within recent times and put them into print along with some notorious suspects, most of whom are just hermits that have no interest in the outside world but, because they're different from the mainstream, got the finger pointed at them. My favorite of that group is a guy called Button Man, who collects things to make buttons. Some of those things include shooting deer to make buttons from the bones. We just happened to read that article and ended up in the valley a few days later, not intentionally, but because it happened to be on the way to our next destination. We found a nice spot to camp next to the river and had a pleasant afternoon swim and evening around the fire. For some reason, and for the first time in my life, I felt very uncomfortable. So I actually went to sleep with a bush knife, machete in other parts of the world, in the swag with me. About 11 p.m., a 4x4 drove up. I'm used to people arriving late, looking for a camp, and quickly moving on. But this vehicle stopped about 10 meters from our swag with the lights on full. I sat for about 5 minutes before driving off. As a former soldier, this gave me the creeps. I snuck out the side of the swag away from the vehicle and crawled with the bush knife around the back of my cruiser and into the bushes coming up on the side of theirs about 20 meters away. While it was sitting there, the person in the vehicle, which I could tell was a dark-colored Nissan Patrol, had music blaring and was just staring at the swag. I chose not to confront them unless they were going to get out. But it was the weirdest thing. On my return home, I found out that the specific site we had camped at was where the people went missing the year prior, and a few months later, a man with a Nissan Patrol was arrested over their murder. That really put the icing on the cake for how creepy it was. And what if? Back when I lived in rural Iowa, about 10 years ago, I lived in a house right off the highway. My house was right between one town and another, almost right on the county line. Our house had a big circle driveway. If you drove in the driveway, you would be going straight towards our barn, 
If you curved right, you could pull into our garage. If you went past the garage, you could circle around in front of the house and pull back out to where you started. Our house had two large double doors in the front, which we rarely used. We always used the door that was inside the garage. One night, it was very late, and my doorbell rang. My husband, my three-year-old daughter, and I were all asleep. It woke me up, and I thought maybe I was dreaming. It rang again. I woke my husband up. He thought I was hearing things until it rang again. It was very dark outside, but we have a dusk to dawn light, so most of the driveway is pretty lit up. Unfortunately, you can't really see the front doors unless you open the door and look out. You can open just one at a time, or you can open them both by using two latch-like things that are at the top and bottom of one of the doors. My husband gets up, and I follow him. He decides he is going to open the door. I want to call the cops, but because we live on the county line, we know it's going to be a while before they can get there. He opens the door to a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looks normal, except for the fact that she's standing at my door in the middle of the night. I look past her, and her car is pulled into my driveway just off the road, not up to the house, not around the circle. She says she needs to use the phone. She says her car battery died or something, she's not sure, but she can't get it to start. I told my husband no ducking way, this is how horror movies start, and we offered to call the cops, which would be the county sheriff. She asks over and over, but I am not letting her in. We tell her we will call, and she kind of stomps off. We watch her walk back to the car, maybe 50 feet away, I'm a bad judge of distance, sorry. I can see her car. I can see her. I call the cops. They say they will be there as soon as they can. About 15 minutes. They don't sound very concerned, and at this point, I'm not really either. I mean, it's just a girl. She probably does have a dead battery. She opens the trunk. No lights come on. She rummages around in the trunk. Then the driver's side door opens. Out steps a guy. Then the back passenger door opens. Out steps one more guy. They all rummage around the trunk. No lights on. I can't hear anything. I can't hear them talking, and I can't tell what they are doing. They all get back in the car. Now at this point, maybe five minutes have gone by, and I am silently praying that the sheriff puts his foot on the gas and gets here quick, but I know it's going to be another 10 minutes or so. They just sit there, in the car, lights off, not moving. I can't see them when they are in the car, but I know they are in there. I know they didn't get out of the car and walk past the house because they would have had to walk right under the dust to dawn. I would have seen them. I think I saw the driver light a cigarette. That part, I'm not sure about. Then I see something, someone walking towards the car from the right, coming from the direction of the barn. It's a man. I have no idea who this man is. We don't have a neighbor for at least a mile, and he's coming from the back of my property, which ends in a creek. He walks under the dust to dawn light straight to the car. He doesn't look at the house, he just walks to the car and gets in the back. The car starts up, and they slowly back out of my driveway and head north. The cops arrive about 10 minutes later, and at this point, I am freaking out. They search around but can't find anything. Ask us if we got a license plate, but they were parked too far away. Tell us to call if they come back, sure, buddy, thanks. My husband goes and gets his shotgun from the shop, on our property, and we try to go back to sleep. They never came back. I don't know who those people were, and I don't know what they wanted. I had never lived in the country before, and I was never happier the day I moved out. This is the story of my first and last camping experience. I was 16 at the time, and my family, my mother, sister, and brother, had made plans to go camping with our aunt, uncle, and two cousins over the weekend. This was my family's first real camping trip, while my cousins, aunt, and uncle had gone camping dozens of times. Our first afternoon and evening of camping actually went quite well. I surprisingly had a lot of fun. Later that night, maybe around 10.30 or so, my cousins, my sister, and I were settling into our tent. We were lying in our makeshift bed when we heard footsteps circling around our tent. Slightly alarmed by this, we sat up and noticed that whoever was outside circling our tent was holding what we assumed to be a stick and tracing the tent as they circled it. At one point, my sister sticks her hand out and feels a leg through the tent's fabric. We knew it wasn't our mom, as she has a trot and her breathing is very deep and distinct. It wasn't our brother because he was only five at the time, and we heard a grown adult's footsteps. Our cousins informed us that it was probably their dad who always liked to play pranks, especially at night. We decided to look out the small window of the tent, which gave us a view that looked towards the road located by our campsite. On the road, my uncle and aunt were walking back from the restrooms. My cousins, sister, and I started to connect the dots, 
whoever was outside circling our tent wasn't a member of our family. It was a complete stranger, and all that separated us from that individual was a thin layer of fabric. As our uncle and aunt approached our campsite, we called them over to our tent and told them what happened. Everything stopped after we talked to our aunt and uncle. We assumed that the individual ran away when our aunt and uncle approached our campsite. My cousins and sister were still understandably freaked out about what had just happened. I, on the other hand, was so tired that I wasn't able to process what had happened and how scary it actually was. The rest of the trip went seemingly well, and I enjoyed the rest of it as much as I possibly could. The worst part of it all is that nobody believed us. In fact, our aunt, uncle, and mother made fun of us and told us that we were being paranoid, as my cousins, sister, and I love everything creepy, from conspiracy theories to urban legends. It still bothers me all this time later because I never found out who that individual was or what their intentions were. I also think about what would happen if our aunt and uncle didn't come when they did. It's not like we'd be able to defend ourselves, as we were just four teenage girls. Ever since then, I've been turned off from camping, and I don't see myself going again in the future. Another park ranger just told me as scary a story. It was one of those late nights on the job. But that didn't bother me at all. In fact, it was one of my favorite parts of being a park ranger. Hanging around late at night with just a few of my fellow rangers in the middle of the woods was just like huddling around a campfire while you told stories. Except we were indoors around a fireplace. It was the middle of spring, but it had been cold lately, so while the afternoons were pleasant, the nights had been chilly. Which was why we were all inside, gathered around a fire while on the clock. The ranger station was beyond comfortable with a fire, so I was contently sitting in one of the many leather couches facing it. We were all midway through a shift, and like many nights on the job, it was quiet, so we got to talking about nothing in particular. There's nothing like the natural flow of an unplanned conversation. Outside, the evening had slowly given way to night, and the darkness had settled upon the woods with its usual silent thoroughness. The area may be a park during the day, but at night, it was the woods. Parks inherently sound fun and bring to mind cookouts, whereas the woods has an inherently spooky vibe. There were four of us sitting by the fire in the ranger station on that chilly night. Me, Harland, Anthony, and Craig. Craig had just finished talking about his cousin's wedding when Anthony asked Harlan what his scariest story was from working here all these years. Usually, Harlan just chuckled and said he'd heard some crazy things over the years. But not this time. This time, he sat there quietly for a moment before he said, The Witch of Blackthorn Creek. That was when we all went completely still. If we were just like people huddled around a campfire, Harlan was the one in charge of building the fire. He was the ranger we always deferred to. He'd been on the job long enough to have earned that right. Harlan's family had also been in the area for generations, so if anyone had any stories to tell about what may have happened here, it was him. Plus, he was a terrific guy. Hardworking and beyond helpful when you needed something. So when someone like Harlan tells you he's heard of a story like that, you listen. Intently. Especially with the tone of voice he used. Serious and no nonsense, without a trace of amusement. The Witch of Blackthorn Creek. Harlan began in a clear voice as we all gave him our full attention. The story was first told to me by my uncle George, who had been a lumberjack for years. According to him, people said there was a curse on the land that was placed there by a witch. It all started one year, when the harvest went bad. Since there had been nothing but plentiful harvests every year, it made people beyond suspicious. There was barely enough grain and stuff to get through the winter. It didn't help matters that the town had generally been prosperous but had recently started to go through some financial difficulties. Then, numerous bits of misfortune happen within the community over the years. Houses are burning down. People go missing and are never found again. Periodically, there would be something odd left lying around near where someone had vanished. Creepy things like weird-looking dolls made from would never fail to rattle people. There wasn't anyone around who people thought was capable of anything like this, and since one of the families in town had experienced something like this before in a different town many years ago, they suspected there was some kind of curse put on them especially after a few people who kept track of all the strange events realized all of them took place on a full moon. Harlan took a sip of his coffee before he continued. It all came to a head when there was a terrible accident at the town lumber mill. A fire that no one could figure out how it started. Several employees died and many others were badly injured, and the lumber mill, which was one of the biggest employers around, closed. That was when the paranoia that had been lingering under the surface boiled over. So when some people from town found an abandoned cottage in the woods near Blackthorn Creek with weird symbols written on the walls and the floor, they grabbed their torches, set the place on fire, and watched it burn. According to the crowd, the cabin took forever to burn. Much longer than people thought possible. 
But once it did finally burn down, they took the ashes and buried them deep in the woods and didn't mark the location, hoping that would be the end of it. And, for a while, that seemed to be the case. But every once in a while, something would happen that would make people in town look over their shoulders. Nothing major. A bit of bad luck in the form of an injury. Or some suspicious noises outside the house after dark, and perhaps some scratch marks on the door or the wall. But ever since then, people would be very careful what they did, especially if there was a full moon. Then he paused for a moment to look at the fire, which was crackling pleasantly in the fireplace. I couldn't tell you how old I was when I first heard the story, but I remember exactly how I felt. Confused. Because the story, although creepy and entertaining, didn't quite make sense to me. And I said something to Uncle George about that. And he laughed. Then he said he agreed that the story was long on atmosphere and short on believability. That's when he got serious. He told me that although the story was a bit of fiction, he never doubted that it came from somewhere, and there was indeed something going on out in the woods. Then he added that it didn't matter how old I was, where I was, who I was with, or what was going on. If I get a terrible feeling, I should listen to it, and I've listened to every feeling I've gotten since then. It's never served me wrong. He looked around at us, slowly taking us all in. I've never quite believed that story, but I will be the last person to deny that in all the years I've been out here, I've felt things on occasion. Things that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And on even fewer occasions, I've seen things. Fleeting glances at things that I wasn't sure I saw. But there was one time when I not only felt something, I heard something. The air in the ranger station was completely still. I briefly glanced at my colleagues as Harlan said this, and they met my glance, and I could see they were just as gripped by the story as I was. It was about 30 years ago, Harlan explained. I was just starting out as a park ranger. This was back in the early 90s, when technology and life in general were very different from today. I'd grown up out in nature, and I'd seen plenty of scary movies, and more importantly, I'd grown up hearing countless spooky stories about what may or may not have been lurking outside, so I wasn't exactly sheltered. But there are some things you're never truly prepared to experience. The fire in the fireplace popped in the grate, but we were so absorbed in Harlan's story that we barely noticed. There was plenty of wood in the fire, so we didn't have to worry about that for a while. It was early November. Halloween had just ended, which made everyone sad because I remember that year was a particularly fun one. Darkness seemed to be arriving earlier and earlier, so I was barely halfway through my shift when the sun was going down. I remember it had been raining almost every day, so the days were all grey and cloudy, and the nights were damp with plenty of fog. But that particular morning was dry. All the leaves that had clung to the trees had been scattered by the winds and rain, so they lay there on the grass, all damp and torn. My job on that particular day was to go around raking them up so they didn't completely cover the trails and paths that people walked on. The chill in the air was that chill only late fall can bring. The dampness that seems to soak into your skin and never let go. I had just finished one section of the park and was walking back to my truck when the rain started up again, and it did so with fury. So I hustled it to the truck, got inside, and headed back to the ranger station, where I planned to spend the rest of the evening. And since it was a quiet night at the ranger station, it looked like I would get what I wanted. I was used to working the late shift by myself as the night supervisor, so being alone didn't bother me. I'd always been a quiet type who liked to read a book, so it was an ideal situation for me. Except for that night, Harlan took a deep breath before he continued. Because Halloween was over and the rain had been steady, the park hadn't received as many visitors as it usually had. But I was inside the ranger station, this ranger station, in fact, which was just as cozy and warm as you see it now. Plus, now that I was done with my task, I was free to read a book, so I wasted no time curling up by the fire with a paperback. I'd spent many a shift this way, and it was fine with me. I'd happily read a book on a nice day, but on a rainy day? Nothing better. Eventually, I started to get hungry. Since I'd just brought a light snack but turned out to be craving something bigger, I decided to order pizza. There was a local joint that was only a few minutes away that often delivered out here back then, so I didn't hesitate to give them a call. I ordered a medium pizza with pepperoni, and as I hung up, the rain started to really pound heavily on the station roof. I knew from experience that the rain pounding on the station roof could truly be loud. It seemed to surround you from all sides. But by the time the headlights pulled into the driveway, the rain had faded to a slight drizzle. But I could see the grass leading up here was pretty well soaked, and there were numerous small puddles on both the grass and the road. The trees were swaying along with the winds, and the sky was getting darker by the minute as night was settling in. By now, the outdoor lights had started to switch on as the car from the pizza place pulled up in front of the station, 
its windshield wipers going back and forth as it stopped in front of the entrance. I stood in front of it, under the part of the roof that kept me out of the rain. The driver, a young guy named Derek in his early 20s, got out of the driver's seat and grabbed the pizza from the passenger's side. Derek had delivered here before, and he'd always done a great job. We chit-chatted as I handed him the cash with a generous tip. Then Derek handed me the pizza and was just about to go back to his car before he stopped and stared at something behind me. He paused and said that it would probably sound crazy, but it looked like there was a woman lurking in the woods near the ranger station. We all sat there silently for a moment before Harlan continued. I remember just standing there when he told me. The words sounded almost foreign as Derek said them out loud. My first reaction was that it was impossible. But there was only one way to find out, so I turned behind me to look at where he was pointing. He took another sip of coffee, the cluster of trees he was pointing at was a dense area of tall pine trees. They've been long gone by now. But back then, there wasn't much in the way of illumination out there, and even I could see there was nothing there. I stood there, the pizza still clutched in my hand, as I waited for anything to happen. But nothing emerged from the woods. I was just about to turn back to Derek when I heard get out from beside me in a hushed voice, clear as could be. I turned around immediately to look at Derek, and without saying a word, I knew he'd heard it too. But while it was as creepy as it could be, I didn't know for sure what it meant. It didn't come out as an ominous command. More like a warning. But I won't lie, standing there outside, I'd never felt fear like that before. I'd been afraid before, and I'd been afraid after, but not like that. That fear was less like a feeling and more like a part of your body. Like, it's always there, and only rarely are you truly aware of it. Sitting there watching Harland, it was clear that although we were sitting there in the present, he had been immediately transported back to that cold November night. I couldn't have told you how much time passed. It may have only been a minute or two. But despite the dwindling light, I thought I could see shapes moving far out in the woods. Very far out. After a moment, you couldn't see anything at all. Then Harlan's voice became quieter. To this day, I have no idea why that sight filled me with so much fear. I also have no idea how I knew it was people. But I did. And I knew it was people, as in more than one. Much more than one. But I had no idea exactly how many. Then, almost as if on cue, I heard the word, now. And it was all the motivation I needed to tell Derek we had to go. He didn't need to be told twice, because we hopped in his car and got out of there as fast as we could. We didn't stop for about 20 miles, and we were far away from the ranger station. By that point, the fear had slowly faded and I was starving, so we split the pizza while debating what to tell my superiors. I eventually decided to say that I was feeling really sick and went to see a doctor I knew. Harlan chuckled. But it didn't take long for me to realize my excuse for leaving would be completely forgotten. Because after I left, the ranger station had been broken into by a group of people. The security camera we had at the time saw all six of them, dressed from head to toe in black, break right through the front door. I just crashed right through it. Then, minutes later, they came back out without taking anything and vanished into the trees. The cops thoroughly searched the area but found nothing. I found out when I called my superiors to tell them I had to leave because I was feeling horrible. From the time on the camera, they appeared to arrive within mere minutes after I left with Derek. We all exchanged glances as the fact that he really was talking about this ranger station dawned on us. Sitting across from us, Harlan didn't say anything, but I knew he could tell the three of us were seeing the ranger station like never before. The conclusion the cops reached, Harland eventually said. Is it that it was a gang of professional criminals who saw the ranger station and decided to see what they could find? Since there was apparently nothing they could make use of, they split. And every year on that day since that happened, I've taken a single flower and left it by where Derek says he saw someone that night. I've never seen or heard that voice since that night, but on occasion, I felt the presence of something or someone watching me, and not in an unpleasant way. But that's the thing about the woods. There's no telling what you may find in them. And if you're really paying attention, it's amazing what you can learn. I learned that November night, all those years ago, was a full moon. The clouds just happened to obscure it out here.